All right, all right. Thank you for joining me in this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Martin Wilson, and we have another fantastic debate for you today. I have Stacey Turbeville and Anthony Rogers here. We're going to be debating oneness or trinity, which is the biblical view of God. And I'm excited, and I thank you for joining me. And as always, I do want to encourage you to like and follow The Gospel Truth. Make sure you hit that like, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and make sure you hit that notification bell so you can stay in the loop with what The Gospel Truth has going on. I do not want you to miss any shows coming up here in the future. That's why it's important that you subscribe. Please do that. Also, if you can, go ahead and share this, this debate as well, man. Tag anybody who you think needs to hear this debate. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, tag it to your social media platforms to make sure they're jumping in on this debate. Uh, that said, all this podcast, all this uh, content, sorry, is on different platforms, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. So make sure you follow and subscribe to those platforms as well. All this content is also on podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. So make sure you subscribe and follow over there as well. Make sure you leave a good rating there so this podcast can get popular. All right. That said, I do have several shows coming up here in the future that I would like for you to know. All right. Coming up on May 14th, Friday, May 14th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is Universalism True at AK Richardson versus West Fallen Camp. And make sure you check that out. Make sure you subscribe to check that out. After that was Mary Sinless. I had Jeremiah Nertil versus Matthew Broderick. Monday, 7, May 17th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. After that is Calvinist View of Election Biblical. I have Stephen Young versus Isaac Hensley, May 22nd, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. After that, Understanding Morality, I have Scarlett Clay versus Shannon Q. Um, that's coming up Monday, May 24th at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that is the next four shows coming up here on The Gospel Truth. Once again, make sure you're subscribing to The Gospel Truth. Make sure you're liking and, it's fu- and, sh- and sharing this content so other people can be in a loop as well. Um, that said, uh, as you know, I have Stacy and Anthony with me, and they're going to be debating once again. One is in Trinity. Uh, what's the biblical view of God? And you guys remember Anthony. Last time Anthony was on, he debated Dale Tuggy, which is a great debate, um, and I think it showed a lot of a lot of uh, areas that 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 are contended with, right? And I think uh, those guys did well in that debate. Uh, I remember Stacy. Stacy came on a while ago, maybe about three or four or five months ago, and he had an eschatology debate with I think with Justin. I can't remember, uh, but it was an eschatology debate, which I think turned out very well. Uh, I do want to do more eschatology debates, so if you're interested in doing eschatology debates. Hit me up, all right? Uh, that said, let me bring these guys in so they can say hi to everyone. How y'all doing, guys? What's up with y'all? What's up? What's up? I'm doing well. Doing well. Glad you guys joined me, man. This is going to be a great debate. It's an early one for me, man. Usually, I'm doing it late night, man. So, we decided to jump in here a little early, man. But before we jump into this debate, I want to give you guys a chance to introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, somebody out there don't know you. So, we're going to start with Stacy, man. Uh, if you don't mind, give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Um, how you doing? I'm Stacy Turbeville. Uh, I've been studying scriptures about 21 years, um, and I enjoy um, debating scripture, um, mainly oneness and uh, Trinity or uh, preterism versus futurism. Um, those are some of the uh, main topics I like to uh, discuss, but I'm looking forward to this one with Anthony. All right, cool. Thank you, Stacy, once again for joining me again. All right, Anthony, you are up for your. Go ahead, give a quick introduction to yourself, man. Yeah, as you said, my name is Anthony Rogers. I am a pastor in the Presbyterian Church of America. I also like to engage people in debates, mainly because I consider it a witnessing or evangelistic opportunity. I'm looking forward to debating Stacy on this issue, although I'm not likely to ever engage in an uh, eschatology debate, not because I don't think it's important, but just because it's uh, kind of outside the range of things I like to uh, spend this kind of time on. I usually like to debate issues of uh, eternal consequence. And uh, but nevertheless, for those that might be interested, Stacy and I did have a little mini debate on eschatology before the broadcast. (laughs) 
All right, cool. Thank you guys. Uh, once again, thank you guys for joining me. And we're going to jump into this debate. Once again, the topic of this debate is one is a Trinity, biblical view of God. Uh, we're going to start that with 15 minute opening statements, then 10 minute rebuttals. So we're going to follow that with 40 minute cross examination. Both parties get 10 minutes each to ask questions, and I'd be followed by 20 minute open discussion. All right, then we'll follow that with another rebuttal of seven minutes, and then five minute closings, and we'll get some questions in from the audience. Sounds good? Yeah. All right. Uh, I did. I don't think we should have hashed out anyway. Which ones want to go first? Because this is not doesn't have an affirmative or negative premise here. So we're trying to. Who, anybody want to volunteer to go first? I'll let Stacy pick. Go ahead, Stacy. What you got? It doesn't matter to me. I, go first. I don't care. All right. Cool, Stacy. All right, man. You're up for your 15 minute opening statement. Uh, let me know, and I will start your time. All right. Am I gonna have a clock on the screen, or I have to? Yeah, you'll have a clock on the screen. I will bring it up uh, once you start, and so you can keep an eye on it. And plus, you'll hear a chime. You'll hear this chime. All right. When you have <laughs> when you have one minute left in your opening statement. All right, sounds good. All right, you got it for fifteen minutes. <clears throat> All right. So when we're discussing God in Scripture, um, what got me started on this is. Um, as I'm studying uh, about preterism and I ran across the study of who God is and I started watching debates and it really started to hit home that we were wrong on a lot of things that we teach in our churches and what was passed down through the generations, um, mainly through the Catholic church. And then um, as the churches broke off and some of the doctrines that they kept, um, and so I got to study and got looking into it. And I've been studying this subject for about five or six years now. And I'm just going to go over some of the things that scripture says about who God is. Then I'm going to backtracking and follow through scripture and show you who Jesus is and what Jesus means. And then I'm going to go over some verses um, that the Trinitarians um, twist to get their teaching. So first, I'm going to talk about who God is according to Scripture. Um, the Bible says clearly that God is one Lord. There's one Lord God according to Deuteronomy. Um, keep that in the back of your mind when you get to the New Testament um, because there's only one Lord. You can't have a Lord in the Old Testament and then a different Lord in the New Testament and call them two separate beings. Um, so the Israelites knew that God was one. Um, God is also, a, Jesus confirms this. He is a spirit. He is an omnipresent spirit. First Kings 8 says the heavens can't contain him. He's everywhere. Um, Ephesians 4, 6 says the Father is above us all, in us all, through us all. The Father is the spirit that is in Jesus, his spirit, singular, Isaiah 42, 1. Um, it's his spirit in us, the new covenant, Isaiah 52, 21. Um, anytime it talks about God in scripture, thousands upon thousands of times, it's in the singular pronoun. Um, I've heard it's 6,000 to 10,000 times God is in the singular. And I know Trinitarians try to use the name of God and say, well, it's a compound name. It means it can mean multiple persons. The problem with that teaching is when you get to the New Testament and you break them down and it reveals the supposed members of the Trinity, they don't explain what the Trinitarians are trying to say that that name means. It goes completely opposite of what they're teaching. And so when you're talking about God, um, he's always in the singular because he is one spirit. He is everywhere. He is the one functioning. The Holy Spirit as a third person, um, you never hear anybody talking about the Holy Spirit in these debates. Um, they just kind of mention that he's the third person. But the Holy Spirit is clear. It's the Father's Spirit. It's, it's his arm. It's an extension of himself. He's, he's omnipresent. It's, it's just the Father in action. It's his power. Um, it's not a separate person. It's himself. Um, there's no reason to separate God from what he's doing and who he is. Um, so 
this Holy Spirit is simply the Father in action. And that Father is the one doing everything in Scripture. In the Old Testament, um, he, he does everything through prophets. He speaks through prophets. He uses messengers, what we call angels in Scripture, um, to get all his tasks done. He uses things um, on this physical earth to get um, his message across and his plan across because God is invisible. Scripture says no one's ever seen God. Um, 1 John 4, 12, nobody's ever seen God. Um, John 1, 18, he's just not been seen because he's spirit. And Jesus said he's spirit. Worship him in spirit because he is a spirit being. He's never been seen. So um, when we say, well, you know, we, sit, we saw him in the Old Testament. No, we didn't see God. You saw a theophany. It's God through something. He was either through a messenger, usually always an angel. Um, so that's how God showed himself. So when we get to the New Testament, he comes in his son. As Hebrews 1, 2 says, he spoke in olden days through the prophets and in many ways, and he spoke through the son in the last days. The last days was the first century um, of Israel when Jesus came on the scene and Jesus's generation that's considered the last days in Scripture but that's when God spoke through the Son the Son never spoke in the Old Testament I know Trinitarians try to say the angel of the Lord is um, is Jesus somehow but that's not scriptural it goes against Scripture um, the Son never speaks in the Old Testament the Son is prophecy in the Old Testament and I'll go over that in a little bit but God, once you get to, um, as you can see, God is a spirit and he's doing many things in different ways in the Old Testament through angels, um, through prophets. When you get to the New Testament, the, um, God does things through Christ and through his spirit. And it's always the Father. It's him. Um, the apostles, you can't find anything about a God the Son in, in Scripture, whether the Old Testament or the New Testament. And so when you get to the New Testament, it's always the Father doing everything, and they're speaking of the Father. Um, in fact, when you look at every single letter written, um, no matter who the writer is, whether it's uh, Paul, John, Peter, Jude, James, every single one singled out the Father as God. Jesus is always called Lord and Christ. But the Father is always singled out as God. Um, and even when Paul um, talks about who God is, he said, um, we got one God, the Father. He always singles out God. Paul even describes in heaven, Jesus the Christ hands the kingdom to our God and Father. Um, always the Israelites... Um, connected God to the Father only. Um, there's no hint of a trinity. Jesus is always called to Christ. And Jesus even mentions in, when he's in Gethsemane praying, he says, um, you alone are, um, he said, you know, you, you are the only Lord. And he's praying to the Father. Um, and he calls himself the Christ in that prayer. He said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you sent. He didn't say, and, and God the Son. He said, and Jesus Christ who you sent. Clearly, Jesus is pointing out that God is the Father. Even um, when he talks about himself, um, he says it's the Father in him that's doing everything. Um, but it's always the Father that's considered God in Scripture. Now, let's backtrack and um, look at Jesus. And I was talking about, you know, Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, what is it saying? Jesus, there's a, there's a verse in the Revelations that says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The spirit of the Old Testament is all about Jesus, but it's about his testimony when, he's, when he lived. It's about, it's all future tense about the Son when He came and became our Savior and was the Messiah. Um, he was the promise of the Old Testament. 
He was the son that is to come. That's why God said, um, today I fathered you. That's a prophecy. It's not saying, there's no hint that Jesus is eternal with the father. First off, think about it. If your name is, if you're called a son, you can't be an eternal with a father. That's an oxymoron. Um, it makes no sense teaching that. He's clearly um, something in the future. And it's always that life that he had in, when he was born in Bethlehem and lived in that first century. That's the testimony in what Jesus did. He was the Messiah. He was the Lamb. Um, and that's what the Old Testament is gearing towards and hinting. All the way from Genesis 3, um, 15, it talks about, you know, Eve's seed is going to um, destroy Satan's head. That is the promise of the covenant at the beginning. That's why Jesus is called the first and the last. He is the first. He is the promise. He is the promise, the beginning of the covenant. And he fulfills the covenant. He is the last. That's what first and last means. <clears throat> um, you can call, um, if you recall in Revelation 22, it also says he's the root and the offspring of David. Jesus is the root. He is the foundation um, of, the co of God's covenant um, of the ages. Hebrews 1, um, it says, you know, the worlds are made through, he through Jesus. It's talking about the ages. That word for world is ages. It's talking about the new covenant age and the old covenant age, the physical and the invisible, as Colossians mentions. The phys it's not talking about Jesus creating the planet. It's talking about the covenant. That's what it's all hinting towards is Jesus through the covenant. He is the creator of the covenant. It's all about Jesus. He is the fulfiller. He is the beginning and the end. Um, he fulfills the old covenant. And he ushers in the new, the invisible, the spiritual kingdom. Because Jesus is called the firstborn. Um, he is the first one with the spiritual body um, that he received when he was resurrected, according to Acts 13.33. So Jesus is, the, is considered a creation and the creator of the new covenant, of the covenants that God um, gave us. Um, God said it's through him. You always notice that it's God through Jesus. God is doing everything through Jesus um, with the covenant. But it's God, when you talk about creation, if you read Isaiah, <clears throat> God alone is the creator. He's by himself. When you talk about physical creation, God is the creator. Um, Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Everything's made by God and it's for him. God the Father. It tells you God the Father. But, every, but the world that is made for the covenants, um, that's why it says he's the firstborn. That's why it also says, you know, he was anointed God in Hebrews 1, 9. He's anointed um, when, when, he's re when he's resurrected and he goes up, the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days is when he gained the kingdom. Um, that's when that new covenant started and that's when um hebrews 1 8 recognizes him as god um he was anointed god because of um the father was in him doing these things um it's always says the father through christ the father reconciled the world through christ second corinthians 5 19. um it's always the father philip philip was um talking to jesus and said lord if you just show us the father we'll believe and Jesus can't lie. What does Jesus say? He said, how long have I been with you and you don't even know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's telling them. He's fulfilling the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say? It said the Lord couldn't find anybody that could be Savior. So with his own arm, he'll bring salvation. His own arm, that's his spirit. That's him, himself. What happened at Jesus' birth? The Father overshadowed Mary and put his spirit in Mary. Um, that is the life that's in Christ. It's the Father that's the Savior, alone, according to Isaiah. He alone is Savior. Um, Zechariah 12.10 says, When they look upon me whom they've pierced when they mourn for him. It's talking about the Father is always recognizing himself in the Son. Um, 
Isaiah 9, 6, the son that is to come will be called everlasting father, mighty God. It's a prophecy verse. The son, a human, is going to have the father in him, saving the world. That's what all the prophecies talk about in scripture. There's not one hint in scripture of a God, the son, and a God, the Holy Spirit, separate from the father. The father is the God of scripture. And when the New Testament is written, they bear that out. They explain that in detail. They make sure they separate it because they want you to know it's the Father in Christ. That's why Jesus is called the Christ. He's anointed with the Father. His name is Jesus because his Father gave him the Father. It was the Father's name, John 5, 43. Um, Jesus was given the Father's name. The Holy Spirit comes in Jesus' name. Um, it's all the Father's name. Um, Jehovah is salvation. In fact, our baptism is way off. We're, we're showing our literacy. Um, Jesus said baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name is Jesus. We're not supposed to be uh, just repeating after him saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Th those are titles. The name is Jesus. And every single baptism in Acts is in Jesus' name. Because that's the name above every name. Everything is in his name in Scripture. All the prophecies is going to be in his name. And All in right, his Stacey, name that's time right there. That's time right there. All right. All right, thank you so much for that opening statement, Stacey. Appreciate you. All right, Anthony, you are up for your 15-minute opening statement. Let me know when you're ready, and I will restart your time and start it. I'm ready. All right, you got it for 15 minutes, Anthony. I want to begin by thanking the triune God for loving me and saving me, and I pray he will do the same for Stacy and others who don't believe in the true God, that he would bring them to himself. Uh, for the sake of time, the doctrine of the Trinity, which I'm defending in this debate, may be distilled into an affirmation of two propositions, both of which are taught in Scripture. First, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternally distinct as to their personhood, and second, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one as to their divine being or essence. More simply put, three persons, one God. Rather than deal with these two propositions uh, separately, I'll seek to establish both simultaneously as I work my way through Scripture. Uh, to begin then, uh, the very terms Father, Son, and Spirit are personal and relational terms, pointing to the distinct and distinguishing properties personal properties of paternity, filiation, and spiration. They're not merely terms that distinguish between the deity and humanity of the Son. They're terms that distinguish between persons. While it's true that a person can be a father and a son, a person can't be his own father or his own son. These are relational terms. The father is the father in relation to the son, not himself. The son is the son in relation to the father, not himself. And the Spirit, as the Spirit of the Father and of the Son, is not the Spirit of himself. Moreover, it's clear from Scripture that these terms represent what has always been true. There never was a time when the Father was not the Father, the Son not the Son, or the Spirit not the Spirit, contra what you heard Stacy say. This can be seen, for example, uh, from the fact that the Son as the Son existed with the Father before the world became, as Jesus said in John 17:5. Father, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you, personal pronoun, before the world became. Notice that Jesus refers to the one that he was with before the creation of the world as the Father, thus pointing up his personal distinction as the Son, and insofar as he existed before the world became and shared in the divine glory, he also, in the same stroke, identifies himself as true deity. The same thing can be seen in Colossians 1, shortly after Paul calls Jesus the beloved Son in 113 and the firstborn over all creation in 115, he went on to say, He, the Son, the firstborn, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In other words, eternal Son. The thing you heard Stacy say isn't found in the Bible. Note, it's as the Son that he's before all things, so the Son as Son is eternal. The fact that he is eternal also entails that he's God, and the fact that he is the Son, as I said, entails that he is distinct from the Father. Scripture also teaches the eternality of the Spirit, the person that Stacy said Trinitarians never mention in these debates. 
But the Spirit is mentioned in distinction from the Father and the Son as an eternal person. For example, in Hebrews 9, we're told that Jesus, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. Note that the Spirit here is identified as eternal, and in the same breath, he's distinguished from the Son and from God the Father. The same Jesus who existed as the Son with the Father from all eternity is also ascribed the divine work of creation, which entails that he existed as the Son at the time of creation. For example, Colossians 1 again, speaking of the beloved Son, says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. In Hebrews 1, 2, it's written that God, through the Son, made the world. And in Hebrews 1, 10, the Father says about the Son, the author of Hebrews is explicit, he says this about the Son, You, Lord, direct address, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Since all of these texts are explicitly talking about the Son in distinction from the Father, he's the one through whom God the Father created, the one God the Father addressed as creator. And since they all identify the Son as the creator of heaven and earth, they at once point up the Son's distinct personhood and true deity. And Scripture also teaches that the Spirit as a distinct divine person, is creator. In Job 33, 4, Elihu said, The Spirit of God has made me. And in Psalm 104, 30, it says, You send forth your spirit, and they are created. Since the spirit is active in the work of creation, he is divine. And since he's active as one sent forth, he is distinct from the one who sent him. We also see this distinction between divine persons with respect to the work of providence. For example, in John 5, 17 and 18, after the Jews accused Jesus of illicitly working on the Sabbath when only God could justifiably engage in such works, Jesus defended his actions by saying, my father has been working to this very day and I too am working. Here, Jesus uses the present uh, of past action still in progress. In other words, the father has been working throughout the past and continues to do so and so has the Son. So not only did the Son exist with the Father from eternity, not only was he active with the Father and the Spirit in the creation of the world, but he has always been at work with the Father throughout the past up to the present. And precisely because Jesus claimed to be the Son of the Father in this radical sense, the Jews in the same context charged him with claiming to be equal with God. So Jesus is distinct from the Father as the Son in the divine works of providence, a fact that entails that the Son, as the Son, is equal with the Father. The same thing is true with respect to the Spirit. After Genesis 1-1 says that God created the heavens and the earth, it says that the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters, which is a way of saying that the Spirit was maintaining or sustaining creation. Psalm 104.30 mentioned earlier not only says you send forth your spirit and they are created, it also says that the spirit whom he sends forth renews the face of the ground. So the spirit, like the son, in distinction from the father who sends him, is invoked in the works of providence, or is involved, excuse me, in the works of providence, uh, upholding and renewing creation. Scripture also says that the son, as the son, as distinct from the Father, existed with the Father prior to the Incarnation. This is evident from the sending, descending, and giving language used in uh, Scripture for the Son. Scripture doesn't just say that Jesus came from heaven or from above as the Father. It never says that. But it says that it was as the Son that he came from heaven. And it says that he came from the Father. He was sent by the Father and was given by the Father. Uh, for example, in John 6.32, Jesus said, It is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven. So it is as the Son that Jesus is given, and he's given by the Father and came down out of heaven. In John 13.3, it is written, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going to God, got up from the supper and so forth. In John 16, 28, Jesus said, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I'm leaving the world again and going to the Father. And in 1630, the disciples responded by saying, we believe that you came from God. 
In order for someone to be sent by or given by or to come from someone, then he must exist as an other at the time he is sent or comes or is given. Since then, the Son was sent by the Father, from the Father, out of the Father, from heaven, from above, into the world. Then the Son existed in distinction from the Father in heaven prior to his descent into the world. And the same sorts of things are said about the Spirit. In John 14, 26, Jesus speaks of the Spirit as the one whom I will send to you from the Father. In 1 Peter 1, 12, he's referred to as the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The Spirit, like the Son, is uh, also said to come from the Father. In 1 Corinthians 2, it says, Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. The Spirit is also given. 1 John 3, 24, we know uh, by this that he remains in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. 1 John 4, 13, he has given to us his Spirit. Galatians 3 speaks of God providing you with the Spirit. Numerous other passages could be given. Uh, now, the same distinction that obtained in eternity at creation in all the successive acts of providence since the beginning of the world and antecedent to the incarnation is also seen all throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. Throughout the New Testament, for example, the Father uses personal possessive pronouns for Jesus, even as Jesus uses personal possessive pronouns for the Father, thus showing that the Father is a person and the Son is a person, and that they're not the same person. The Father speaks, for example, of Jesus as my Son, Matthew 2, 15, 3, 17, 17, 5, a slew of other passages. Jesus speaks of the Father as my Father, Matthew 7, 21, 10, 32, 10, 33, many other passages. Uh, similarly, the apostles speak of the Father in relation to Jesus as his Father, Matthew 16, 27, Mark 8, 38, and of Jesus in relation to the Father as his Son, Romans 1, 3, Romans 1, 9, Romans 5, 10, more passages. So the Father is the Father of a person, namely his Son, and the Son is the Son of a person, namely his Father. Besides this, Jesus also uses words like also, which means in addition, in reference to the Father. John 5, 19, whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in the same way. 5, 21, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to whom he wills. 5, 26, just as the Father has life in himself, notice himself, so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Two selves, John 8, 19, if you knew me, you would know my Father also. 14, uh, 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. 15, 9, just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. 15, 23, the one who hates me hates my Father also. 20, 21, just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. 1 John 2, 23, the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Also, similarly, Jesus uses the word both in reference to himself and the Father. The literal Greek of John 15, 24 says, they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. As well, Jesus speaks of the Father as someone other than himself. In John 8, 18, Jesus said, my other witness is the Father. Notice that this other, uh, the Father, is a witness, and so not merely a nature that's in Jesus, but a person, a witness. Jesus also referred to the Father as another in 532 of John. There is another who testifies about me, and I know that the testimony which he, personal pronoun, third person, gives about me, first person pronoun, is true. Jesus speaks the same way about the Spirit in John 14, 16. I will ask the Father, and he, third person pronoun, will give you another advocate to help you. In John 8, 16 and 1632, Jesus said, with a view to the Father, I am not alone. In uh, fact, uh, in 8, 16, after saying I'm not alone, Jesus went on to say, I stand with the Father who sent me. In 1632, similarly, Jesus said, my Father is with me. John 8, 38, Jesus uh, spoke of the things which I have seen with my Father. Precisely because Jesus was not alone, 
be, uh, because the Father is another, someone other than Jesus, someone with Jesus, someone who loves and testifies about Jesus, Jesus could say in John 8, 17 and 18, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Now, if all that were not enough, Jesus referred to the Father and to himself and to the Spirit as we, us, and our, which are plural personal pronouns. In John 3.11, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I tell you, uh, we speak of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Likewise, in John 14.23, Jesus said, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them, and we will make our home with them. In John 17, Jesus prayed for the disciples to the Father, saying, May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Here Jesus refers to the Father as you, to himself as me, and to both of them as us. Jesus uses the word before in the sense of in front of in reference to the Father. Matthew 20, 32, everyone who confesses me before people, I will also confess him before my Father. The same thing in John 10, 33, in Revelation 3, 5, and in other passages. Uh, Jesus also speaks of appealing to the Father in Matthew 26, 53, and of hearing from the Father in John 15, 15. In Matthew 11 and Luke 10, Jesus said, No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son determines to reveal Him. Since only persons know, and since this knowing is reciprocal or mutual between Father and Son, it entails a plurality of personal subjects. Moreover, the knowledge that both have of the other is absolute or independent. The Father and the Son both know each other, and human creatures only come to share in this knowledge through the volition right. of the Son. So in All contrast, right, Anthony, the creature... That's oh. time right there. That's 15 minutes there. All right, guys, so now we're going to transition to our rebuttal round. Uh, once again, these are 10-minute rebuttals. So, Stacy, let me know when you're ready, and I will start your time for your 10-minute rebuttal. Okay. All right, you got it for 10 minutes, man. Um, you notice, Anthony, he's talking about um, the, Jesus talked to the Father, and they both use uh, pronouns, singular pronouns of each one. Of course they are. Jesus is a human talking to the Father, talking to God, just like we talk to God. Um, of course it's going to use uh, pronouns um, when you have a man talking to God. He, he did not say anything about who God is in Scripture. He's he always talking about is trying to separate the three um, and trying to make them into three persons. Um, like I said, clearly Scripture says the Father is the Holy Spirit. It's His Holy Spirit. Um, Isaiah 63, Isaiah 64, the Lord God, Father's Holy Spirit is what it says. His Spirit. Um it's always the Father's Spirit. Jesus came to reveal the Father, John 1, 18. He didn't come to reveal a God the Son. Nothing is mentioned in the Scripture on a God the Son. It's always to glorify God the Father, who is the Father of Scripture. It's all about the Father. And that's who Jesus is trying to reveal to us. Um, Jesus said um, in John 8, 24, you know, when he talks about, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Um, he clearly in three verses later in 827 says he was talking about the father. The I am was the father in Exodus 3. There's no son anywhere in the Old Testament other than prophecy. It's all prophecy about the father coming to be the savior because man couldn't do it. Um, just um, talking about the pronouns when Jesus was here on earth, it's just um, twisting the scriptures. It's not looking at what are the teachings of scriptures, who is God in the scriptures. Um, all, all the writers were um, clear that it's the Father. Um, Anthony brought up Colossians uh, 1, and he talked about, see, Jesus made the invisible and, and the physical. 
Um, first off, you start at 15. It says he's the image of the invisible God. Well, right there, he's the image of the Father. The invisible God is the Father. Um, and if you remember, uh, Philippians 2 um, said being in the form of God. You know, Trinitarians try to say, see, he's God right there. Well, according to Paul, if you go one chapter prior, Philippians 1, God is the Father. So Jesus being in the form of the Father is what he means in Philippians 2. Um, there's no trinity there. All the writers are clear. It's the Father's Spirit. It's the Father in um, that came. So when Jesus is talking about um, my spirit, I came forth from the Father. I'm going back to the Father. Of course he is. That's the God that went in him and is leaving him. Jesus is not contradicting what he just said in John 17, 3. He clearly told you the only true God is the Father, and he's Jesus Christ. He is the anointed one of the Father. He doesn't say he's a God the Son. It's nowhere in Scripture. He's the anointed one of the Father. The Father is the God in him that he knew beforehand. Uh, the Father knowing him before, um, John 17, 5, is talking about his same spirit that he shared with the Father. Of course, it's the Father's spirit. It was the, He was the Father um, before he became the person. That's what he's talking about. His spirit leaving and going back to the Father. It's not going back to a trinity. Um, notice everything that we're going to talk about tonight. Nobody is going to say, no Trinitarian, just like Anthony, will never say anything about um, that spirit being a trinity spirit. It's always the Father's spirit in heaven. His spirit in us is singular. It's the Father's spirit. Um, it's always the Father. And, and let's look at Colossians again. If you go to Colossians 1.19, look at what it says. Um, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in, in Him. It's the Father's good pleasure. That's the fa Why? Because the Father's God. The Father is the God of Scripture. It's Him putting Himself in the Son. He put the fullness in Christ, not a trinity. There's no trinity up there. Um, sharing this spirit with this man on earth um it's always the father he's the one that's through christ doing all these things everything in colossians 15 through 19 is talking about the old the covenant the creation the creation talked about and being the head of the body of the church all these things are terms about the covenant the invisible and invisible that jesus created the heavens and the earth it's representing Israel. In the Old Testament, Israel represented heavens and earth. And that's what they're talking about. It's not talking about Jesus actually created heavens and earth. If you go to Psalms 8, 6, it clearly says that the Father created, uh, is the creator and he assigns it to the Son. It's the Father alone that's the creator according to Scripture. Um, Isaiah 44, 24, is he creates it all by himself. Scripture cannot have contradictions like this. It can't say, well, the Father alone is God and he's the creator, and then say that Jesus created the heavens and earth um, through by the Father. That's not a contradiction. contradiction. What it's saying is Jesus is the creator um, and the firstborn of the new covenant, the covenant promised in Genesis in the beginning. That's the beginning they're talking about. That's the root they're talking about. That's the beginning and the end that they're talking about. It's all about Jesus. It's the spirit of prophecy. But the God is the Father, um, like I showed. Every single writer, God's the Father. He's the one in the Son. Um, how much time I got left? Yeah, yeah, about um, three and a half minutes left. It's up in the upper uh, left hand corner. Let me, I'm going to read a passage you'll never hear anybody um, re tell you um, about or read in church. But listen to what Jesus said. These things I've spoken to you in figurative speech. There's an hour coming that I will no longer speak to you in figurative speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Jesus is talking about the Father. That's who he is on earth. Um, when did he explain about the Father? He's talking about after the resurrection when he opened the book and he showed himself in the Old Testament. That's what he's talking about. He's showing them that he was the father that came um, to die for our sin, as Zechariah 12, 10 says. 
Isaiah 49, 16. He was engraved us on the palms of his hands. That's the Father talking. Um, but if you keep reading, listen to what he says. On that day you will ask in my name, and I will not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and you have believed that I came from the Father. I came from the Father, I came into the world, and I'm going back to the Father. It's talking about the Spirit in him as the Father. Um, he's not going to be um, acknowledged on our behalf to the Father because he's going back to being the Father, the one Lord in Revelations 22. Um, it, Zechariah 14 9 says, In that day, um, there will be one Lord. Um, that's what happened in Revelations. Um, I know it's another subject, but the new covenant, whence it came, and, and the earthly ministry is complete, and what Jesus did in his physical body, he gave up that physical um, kingdom to, the, to God the Father, the spiritual kingdom. And now the Father reigns through the new covenant age through his spirit that came down into earth called the new covenant and that's what's prophesied in the old testament his spirit in us he will write his laws on our heart it's his spirit singular it's always the father in scripture you're going to hear a lot of trying to separate the three of course um there are three um ways in god has revealed himself you have a man but it's the father spirit Jesus said it was. He never. There's no mention of a God the Son in the entire Bible. It's 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 the missing link. And then to call the Holy Spirit separate, um, to even mention the Holy Spirit as being separate, um, it, it makes no sense. It's the Father's Holy Spirit. It's a part of Himself. It's an extension. The Hebrews used physical terms to explain the Spirit. They would use. They would say God's hand, God's face, you know, um, God's arm. It was just a way to explain the spirit because you can't explain an omnipresent spirit. But God is clear. By his own spirit, by his arm, he'll bring salvation. It's part of himself. He hovered over Mary and put himself in Mary. That's why Jesus is called Son of God. Um, even though Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit, if there's a trinity and the spirit is not the Father, he should be the Son of the Holy Spirit, but He's not. He's the Son of the Father because the Holy Spirit is the Father. He's holy and He's the Spirit, the one Spirit talked about in Ephesians 4. Um, All right. That's time right clear. there. That's time right there. All right, Anthony, you're up for your 10-minute rebuttal. Let me know you're ready, and I'll start your time. I'm ready. All right. You got it. 10 minutes. All right. In Stacy's opening presentation, he said he was going to cover three main issues, who God is, who Jesus is, and then five twisted verses used by Trinitarians. Well, I can make quick work of those five verses allegedly twisted by Trinitarians because Stacy never actually dealt with them. He never actually moved to his third point. With respect to who God is, we mostly heard a bunch of assertions and very little scriptural argumentation. Now, he did allude to various passages here and there, uh, but nothing, I think, that uh, really ought to be confused with a real case that is being made for oneness theology. Uh, Stacy said things like, the Father is the only true God, John 17, 3, the Father is the one God. Of course, I as a Trinitarian do not disagree, and the historic Christian church has never disagreed that the Father is the only true God. That's a fundamental tenet of Trinitarianism. What the verse does not say is that only the Father is the true God. So clearly, Stacy has the syntax wrong here. Scripture is clear that the Son is God, and it's clear in all the ways that I already mentioned. For example, uh, according to Stacy, the Son refers to the humanity of Jesus and so didn't exist until uh, the conception of Christ in Mary's womb. But in my opening presentation, I argued that the terms Father, Son, and Spirit are relational terms that point to persons. We heard no refutation of that. I also pointed to the fact that these uh, terms refer to eternal relations. I mentioned John 17, 5, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world became. Stacy's answer here was entirely convoluted. 
he said uh, that Jesus was referring to himself as the Father before he became the Son here. That is not at all what the text says. Jesus is talking to his Father, and he speaks of having glory with the Father, not as the Father, before the world became. I also mentioned Colossians 1, where it says that Jesus, as the beloved Son, is the one who created all things. Here, Stacy argued that because it calls Jesus the image of of the Father, uh, that it's somehow re, uh, not referring to uh, creation. I'd like to hear Stacy more on that to make sure I've got his point right. But uh, he also argued that this is simply a reference to uh, the new creation. But that is not at all adequate. He said this is a way of referring to Israel in the Old Covenant. But notice in Colossians 1, it very clearly is not using these terms in reference to Israel as his new creation. It says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Those are terms referring to hierarchies of angelic beings. It's not a reference to Israel. Uh, he made a number of other claims uh, but the, the fundamental issue that Stacy is not really dealing with is the fact that these distinctions that are drawn between Father, Son, and Spirit are not distinctions that point to uh, a difference between Christ's deity, referred to as the Father, and his humanity, referred to as the Son, but between persons. It's the Son who has two natures, deity and humanity, and the deity of Christ is not the Father. Uh, that's evident from the fact that the Father created all things through the Son, as I already pointed out. Hebrews 1.2 says the same thing. He created the worlds through the Son. Hebrews 1.10, referring to Psalm 102, which is about the original creation, not the new creation, the Father says about the Son, you, Lord, in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. Right, the heavens are the uh, uh, foundation, or you laid the foundations of the heavens and the earth. I already pointed out as well that the Spirit is identified as Creator, and He's identified as the Creator in distinction from the Father. In Psalm 104:30, you send forth your Spirit, and they're created, and you renew the face of the earth. I pointed out that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all involved in the divine works of providence throughout the past up until the present. We had no answer from Stacy. John 5, 17 and 18, my Father has been working to this very day, and so too have I. Uh, the Spirit is portrayed as engaged in providence in uh, Genesis 1-2 and Psalm 104-30, in distinction from the Father who sent him forth at the time of creation. The scripture also continues to personally distinguish between Father and Son at the point of the incarnation. And not, it's not simply a distinction between natures. The Father refers to Jesus as my Son, personal pronoun. Jesus refers to the Father as my Father, personal pronoun. Uh, Jesus refers to the Father as someone in addition to himself and uses pronouns for the Father and pronouns for himself. These are personal designations. They're not simply a way of referring to impersonal natures that belong to a singular person. That's simply not what's in view in these passages. Scripture does teach that Christ has two natures, but it doesn't teach that by means of these terms, Father and Son. These are relational terms that speak about persons. He speaks about the Father also, or the Son is also in addition to the Father. He speaks of both me and my Father. Uh, he speaks of the Father as other and as a witness who is other than himself, a witness who is another from himself. He says he's not alone. He's with the Father. Uh, over and over again, Jesus distinguishes between himself and the Father, and uh, uh, between his, uh, the Father as Father and himself as the Son. Uh, he said that uh, Jesus uh, can't be, he, 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 this is uh, astounding to me, uh, Stacy said that Jesus became God at the time of his anointing, because Psalm 45 says uh, that he was anointed. But Psalm 45 uh, speaks of him being God, uh, quite independently of his anointing. Notice what it says. In Psalm 45, it says, Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and in your majesty, and in your majesty ride on victoriously. And then it goes on, verse 6, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. And then it goes on to say, Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. It's not that he is being anointed so that he would be God. It's God who is being anointed. And that, of course, is the Orthodox Christian position. It was God who came in the flesh and was anointed as the Messiah. Uh, he appealed to the classic oneness uh, uh, texts that uh, don't teach oneness theology. 
uh, uh, Isaiah 9, 6, where it, it says that he is uh, everlasting father. The Hebrew syntax there, it's aviad in Hebrew, which means father of everlastingness or eternity. It means that he's the possessor of that quality. When somebody's called the father of lies, like Satan, it means that he's a liar by nature. When somebody's called the father of strength or the father of righteous, it means they're strong, they're righteous. When it says aviad, father of everlastingness, it means that he's everlasting. It's not calling himself his own father. That's not what the text is talking about. John 14, when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, he's not saying I am the father. In fact, in the same context, he says, you believe in God, believe also in me, John, uh, John 14, 1. Uh, later, he speaks of himself as the way to the Father in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Uh, in the same context, when Jesus said, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says not only believe that the Father's in me, but believe that I am in the Father. Uh, so uh, the, the distinction between father and son is pronounced, it's repeated in scripture, it's unavoidable, and it's not a distinction between two natures, it's a distinction between uh, two persons. Uh, uh, Stacy also made other claims like, uh, you know, the son wasn't active in the Old Testament period, he's simply mentioned there uh, it, prophetically, but that isn't true. The New Testament repeatedly speaks of the Son being active in the Old Testament, and it speaks of him being active as the Son, not only because it identifies him as the Creator, the, the Son as the Creator under the Old Covenant, uh, but when you look at passages like Hebrews 11, it says that Moses determined to suffer along with Christ and his people, right? So Moses is identified with Christ under the Old Covenant, uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that Jesus was the one who led Israel through the wilderness. Jude 1.5 says Jesus is the one who saved them from Egypt. Uh, over and over again, the Old Testament speaks of Jesus being active uh, under the Old Covenant and in the Old Covenant period. He said that Jesus is not the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is not a distinct person according to the Old Testament. Well, most certainly the angel of the Lord is a distinct person according to the Old Testament. In Exodus 23, the Father refers to the angel of the Lord as my messenger, my angel. He's spoken of as being sent by the Father repeatedly in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord speaks about the Father in the Old Testament. He even speaks to him while on earth in Zechariah chapter 1. Uh, in in uh, Zechariah chapter 3, uh, verse 2, the angel of the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, referring to the Lord in the third person. Clearly, the angel of the Lord is distinguished from another divine person, but Stacy admitted that the angel of the Lord is a divine theophany. So on Stacy's own reasoning, the angel of the Lord is a divine person. On the evidence I've provided you, he's distinct from another divine person. More evidence could be given, uh, you know, Genesis 16, verse uh, 7 through 14 uh, the angel of the Lord is called Jehovah by Moses, and he's called the God who sees me by Hagar. And yet the angel of the Lord refers to the Lord in that passage as a person distinct from himself. He says, the Lord has given heed to your affliction, speaking to Hagar. In Exodus 24, 1, referring to the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself says to Moses, come up the mountain to the Lord. So here's the Lord speaking about the angel All of the right, Lord, Anthony. and he calls him Lord. That's time right there. All right, guys, great stuff, good opening statements and rebuttals. So now we're going to transition to cross-examination. Once again, it's going to be a 40-minute cross-examination. The first 20 minutes would be 10 minutes each to ask questions, and that'll be followed by a 20-minute open discussion to tackle those lingering questions. Uh, starting with Stacy, you're up for your 10-minute cross-examination of Anthony Rogers. Okay, you brought up Psalms 45. Um, is a co-equal God, um, a part of God as the Godhead. How is that possible when the Father is his God? Is that your full question? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, first of all, I didn't say... Uh, first of all, I didn't say... I didn't say that the Son is part of God. I don't believe that God is a composite being. The persons of the Trinity are one as to their essential nature and being. So the Son is not a portion of the deity, uh, but he possesses the entirety of the deity. That's Orthodox Nicene Christology. He is homoousius, one essence with the Father, which is an indivisible essence. Where the distinction is drawn is as to his personhood. It's the person of the Son who is distinct from the Father, uh, as a bearer of the divine nature. 
Uh, now, as for the statement, uh, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of joy, that at that point in the psalm, it does have in view the fact that the Son has become incarnate. And as incarnate, Jesus can refer to the Father as his God. There's no dispute there. Uh, the point that I was making from Psalm 45 is that the Son is identified as God antecedent to his act of being anointed or the act of him being anointed. So when does Jesus become God the Son again? Because in heaven, he still calls God his God in Revelations. So it's, well, that's a false assumption. I, I wouldn't say that he becomes God the Son again. He's always been God the Son. He never ceases to be God the Son. I'm also not a hyper-preterist, so I might be wrong in assuming that on your view, when Jesus ascends into heaven, he's no longer embodied, uh, so that you think of Jesus. Is that your assumption here? Well, no, Paul says uh, we don't know how he is now, but we know we'll be like him. He's in a spiritual body, but we don't know what. Um, he's uh, no, not that's in a physical not, body. Yeah, that's, not, that's not what it says. And scripture is clear that he is in a physical body. Paul says yeah. in Colossians 2, 9, in Christ dwells, present tense, all the fullness of deity in bodily form. Presently, Christ is embodied. In 1 Timothy 2, it says there is right now one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. In Acts 17, 31, it says that God has fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So Jesus is still embodied. No, Jesus um, is in a spiritual body. Flesh and flesh and uh, the spirit does not have flesh and blood. There's no human body floating around in the sky. No, nobody said anything about it floating, but are you just going to dismiss the three texts I just rattled off for you? I could give you more. But that's not what it's, it's he's, he's, um, Jesus said um, he'll never again one day be the son of man. He's not, he, he's uh, the king of the without observation. He's in, invisible. Jesus came where, where? invisibly. Hey, Stacy, let's, sure, let's make sure we're asking questions. Oh, okay. Um, okay, who was, um, the, who was God in Jesus when he was on earth? Who's the God in Jesus? Well, so first of all, I think you are just out of step here with classical Trinitarian theology, not to mention the Bible, but according to classical Christian theology, all three persons are always present in and with the others. So even uh, though the incarnation was the personal act of the Son, the Son became incarnate, he was never separated from the Father. Uh, Jesus said, the Father is always with me. With, the term with presupposes distinction, but it also presupposes unity. He is always with him. So scripture speaks of the Son as a person being incarnate, but it also speaks of the Father being in and with him because the persons of the Trinity can never be separated. They co-inhere or mutually indwell one another. Well, Jesus said the Father is who's in him. He didn't say there was, there, God the Son's never mentioned anywhere. Can you show me a passage? So the, the point that I've made repeatedly, both in my opening and then in my refutation or rebuttal, is that Scripture distinguishes Father, Son, and Spirit and identifies this as an eternal distinction. It does so in passages like John 17, 5, where Jesus said, Father, so he's uh, assuming here himself as the Son, Father, the correlative is Son, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world became. So Jesus is eternal Son, as a matter of logical inference. So yeah, it's it's inferred. It's exactly there's no verses. It's, lo on. it's logic. It's logically inferred. And so if you reject the logic, then said, I think I if you reject logic, then you've simply made my case for me. Your position okay. is irrational. Isaiah forty two one, a prophecy on Christ. Uh, God says, "I will put my spirit on him." That's singular. How's that a trinity? Uh, well, I think you got a problem here. I don't know why you're bringing up this text. He says, I will put my spirit on him. So there's one personal pronoun, my. He's putting his spirit on another called him. And so he's distinguishing right. himself from the him upon whom the spirit is being placed. And so you have three personal subjects here, whether you like it or not. It's not modalism. You, you don't put a spirit on a spirit. He put his spirit you, in a you, human. It, you also don't put your spirit on yourself. He doesn't say, I will put my spirit on myself no, in a human no, body. No, he put his spirit in a human. 
That's that's it the doesn't prophecy. say in it, it doesn't say in it says on. Well, in on however you want to say it. He's leading. Well, I'd like that. to say it. I'd like to say it how Isaiah says it because the prepositions are important. Well, it's that's right, and it's singular. It's the Father always. What's the Father always? It says, "I will put my Spirit upon uh, Him." Malachi two ten says, "There's we have one Father." So Isaiah that's nine six says, "The Son that is to come will be called everlasting Father." How do you um, explain that away from being the Father? I don't explain it away because I'm not a modalist. What I do is simply interpret the passage according to the Hebrew idiom. Uh, the syntax is avi ad. Av is the word for father. It precedes the, the phrase ad, referring to everlastingness. I explained this in my rebuttal when I pointed out that in Hebrew, when you refer to somebody as the father of something, you're identifying him as the possessor of that quality. So if you call somebody the father of lies, such as the author of heresy, Satan, uh, you're saying he's a liar. Okay, You're not saying that he literally has a child named lies. When Jesus is called the father of everlastingness, it's saying he possesses that quality. He is everlasting. You and I both would agree that he's everlasting. Where we disagree is uh, on the idea that he is God the father. That text doesn't say that, and that's why your theology isn't found in that text. Every writer in the New Testament says they distinguish God as the Father and Jesus as the Lord Christ. How do you explain that as a trinity? Well, by denying your claim that that's the only way they speak or that's how they always speak. That's uh, why you mentioned every, for, speaks. every single letter says that. Every single no Okay, tell me what every tell me what every single letter says. It doesn't say that. Go ahead. It says the Lord it says um God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Or okay, his, so so it calls him. It says, so it says God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Both right. terms are divine terms drawn from the Old Testament. The term God is a divine term. The term Lord is a divine term. God coming from Elohim, Lord, the covenant name of God. And it's clear that the term is being used as a divine title in these contexts because it says grace and peace to you, these divine blessings, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace and peace come equally from Father and Lord uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a distinction between the deity of the Son and the humanity of the Son, or uh, the humanity of Jesus. It's a distinction between the Father, who is the divine person, God, and the Son, who is a divine person, the Lord. Well, well, Jesus has put Lord over us, but he's under Christ, God, according to uh, 1 Corinthians eleven three. The Father is over the Son, he he who's in the Son is Lord over us. So how do you get a trinity if the Father's over the Son? Every, everywhere the Father's over the Son. So where do you get this trinity? Uh, again, I mean, well, this just deals with the incarnation, the mediatorial office that Christ assumed by coming into the world to be our Savior. I mean, this is the gospel. I'm not sure why this... Uh, you know, is so is so difficult. This this is basic 101 Christianity. The Son of God condescended to enter into the world, submitted to his Father, obeyed his Father, and uh, by virtue of this is subject to the Father. That's, you know, not not shouldn't be a point of contention between us. Uh, but it's not a it's not that the Son's humanity is subject to uh, the the you know, the, the divinity in Jesus. It's the person of the Son who submitted to the Father. So in heaven, Jesus is called Lord Jesus, and he hands the kingdom to our God. God the Father is who is distinct in heaven as called God, and Jesus hands the kingdom to him. How do you explain uh, Jesus that away? Jesus is not only identified as the one who will hand over the kingdom to the Father, which is in 1 Corinthians 15, but in the book of Revelation, no S on that, by the way, yeah, I think we should read that more carefully, but in the book of Revelation, the same Jesus is identified as God. In Revelation 1.8, the coming one is identified as he who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So he's not only identified as someone who was subject to the Father by virtue of his incarnation and his mediatorial role, he's also identified as true deity. All right, that's time. 
All right, Anthony, you're up for your 10 minute cross examination of Stacy. Okay, Stacy, I didn't mention it in my opening presentation, but I think uh, in my rebuttal, I've covered most things that I wanted to cover. And in your cross examination, I think we covered some more things. So I think what I'll do is just bring up here John 1 1, classic text, probably one you expected uh, to come up in this discussion. Uh, in John 1 1, who is the word that is said to have been with God from the beginning? The word is about Jesus because the Old Testament is the spirit of prophecy that is about Jesus when he comes, which is fulfilled in verse 14 when he when the word becomes flesh. The prophecy okay, so becomes flesh in verse 14. So you're saying, but so you're saying that... It. Wait, what? A word is an it. And it okay, was... Well, and, and some of the... Um, Translators in the 1500s got it right when they put uh, translated a word as an it in the first few verses, because well, that's the, the, what God's word is. He creates yeah, through I, His word. Wait. So, to your knowledge, does the word "it" as it was used in uh, uh, earlier times in older English, was it functioning as a neuter pronoun? Well, that word is it's according to what the word is that is functioning after. If it's a, a word, is well, it? The word is okay, logos, so, and logos is used 69 times, and it means word. No way to spin okay. this word. Logos means word. Okay. I'm satisfied that you, you. Now you're just it now you're just repeating yourself. Let me get because it fulfills the story. Let me. But the point. Let me get to my question now, Stacy. Right, let's, uh, let's not let's not let's not filibuster. Let's make sure we're allowing answer the question. Let's yeah. not do off long runovers and 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 then another question. All right, guys. Yeah. So it says uh, the word was in the beginning with God. Why does it use the word with there? Because the word is in God's mind. It's the plan. Does um, it say Jesus in or with? It's with God. It's in his mind. What is a word? A word is not a person. If Jesus is actually there, it would say God the Son, but it doesn't. Okay. So, so it says with. It that word. Say. You have to twist okay. that word to mean something else. It does not mean, mean the person to, was there. The are word you saying I have there. to twist the word with to mean in? It says the word was with God, proston theon. Can you give yeah. me an example of that expression ever being used in reference to an impersonal thing being with or in another? No, but it's, I mean, that's not the point. What's the subject matter? No. It's God's word. <laughs> Jesus that, that was saying for the foundation of the world. That's plan language. But, it wasn't, it didn't really happen then. The whole point but, is that the word was with God. And notice at the end of that verse, it says, and God was the word. The word is about God, and God is the Father. Once again, God is the Father in Scripture to every single writer. So whatever that plan is by God is about Him, and He is the one in His plan that's going to come through this Savior. That's what it means. It doesn't mean a God the Son. Otherwise, in John 18, 32, you got two Jesuses, because it says the Lagos of Jesus. So if you're going to use that term, uh, the way you're using it, then you have to say, well, there's two Jesuses. There's not. Logos uh, means word that, because that's what it's that, translated as. Okay. Okay, Stacy. That's that's fallacious. The term logos can be used in different ways. In John 1, it's no, been used it as a is title. No, it's not. It's used as a word. Show me in Scripture where it's used as a person. Uh, that, we're, that's what we're uh, talking about right now. So you're, you're begging the yeah, question. Yeah, one verse. The, and a prophet in, is In John one. Right. Right. Stacy, you're not so allowed you to ask questions. Anthony, you're asking questions. This is Anthony's time to ask questions. Stacy, you're not allowed to ask questions. Okay, so Stacy, you've admitted that you have to make the word with mean in. You've admitted that the phrase prostantheon is never used to refer to impersonal things being with a person. Uh, you just said uh, God was the word, by which you take it to mean uh, the Father is the word. But that's not the syntax of the Greek. Can you justify that claim? The syntax of the Greek is opposite of what you just said. No, it's about word again is impersonal. It's God's word and it's about him. The Israelites knew it, they can they, they put God with his word. They saw it as himself. But like I said again, okay, so the word is the word was with God. 
It was not a God the Son. What is God's word? It's the Old Testament. Uh, it's the plan. Uh, when did that become fulfilled? Verse 14, it became flesh. The plan became okay, flesh. So you, so you said, Stacy, that the word is in God, and then you said that God is the word. So is God in himself? No, the word is representation of God himself. It's from God. I'm sorry, it just refutes what you're saying. Lagos is not used as a person in scripture. You try to twist this one verse, but guess what? A prophet is subject to a prophet. There's no prophecy of private interpretation. You can't make a verse say what you want if you don't find it anywhere else you, in scripture. Okay, and so I think we agree. Else. I think you agree. we agree. You can't make a text mean what it doesn't say, so we shouldn't make the word with mean in when that's not what it means in Greek. We shouldn't make prostantheon mean an impersonal thing with a person when it never means that. And we shouldn't say that the word is in God and then turn around and say the word is God or God is the word because then it would mean that God is in himself. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, now let's move through the context. In, in verse 2 it says, He was in the beginning with God. Hutos. It uses a masculine pronoun. What justification contextually do you have for understanding this as an impersonal thing? He is in the beginning with God as the word, the plan. The plan was in the beginning with God. That's why they use the word Lagos. If God the Son is there, there's no reason to, to come up with this phrase. It's literature. There's nowhere in Scripture where Jesus is anywhere in the Old Testament with the Father in the beginning. That's not what they're talking about. Jesus is that, the fulfillment that. of the Father's plan. He was slain from the foundation of the world. We're chosen from the hey. foundation of the world. Were we there before thanks, the foundation? Thanks the for world? sharing. Thanks for sharing yeah. other texts that aren't about the one I'm asking you about. So in John 1, 1, it goes on in verse 4 to say, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Why? Why does it refer to him repeatedly using masculine pronouns? In it was life. God's word is what it's talking about. What's, um, what's your justification for reworking the grammar? Word, God's word what, what's your justification life. for repeatedly calling the word in it when John never does? Um, it's, that word is used for it or he. It's according to what the um, text Which is word? using. And oh, a word is okay. It. If you're going to make that claim, if you're going to make that claim, what's the word that's used there that you're saying means it? A word is an it. Thanks. Thanks for admitting that you don't know what the Greek term is there. If you don't know what the Greek term is there, word why is pontificate about the meaning of the word? Uh, I'm talking word about the pronouns it. that are used for the son. Uh, it says, for example, in there's uh, no word. It does uh, not say son there. It does not say son. It, nobody's the, asking the about word, that. We're asking about the, the personhood of the word. Bad. In fourteen, in verse three, it's in verse three. It says, "All things became through him." D out to It uses dia with the genitive, which always indicates personal agency. Why does John use this language of personal agency for the word, saying that the word who is with God is the one through whom all things were made? Once again, all things through Christ are about the covenant and about all the Old Testament, all the promises, all the prophecies about Christ. It's through Christ. But who's doing it? It's the Father. So, it's God so John 1.3 1, is talking about the covenant. Do you see the word covenant there? No, but that's what they're talking about. You, you, scripture okay, can't what's your evidence for scripture. that? The Isaiah okay, says but you the can Father contradict alone. Scripture. Hold scripture on, no, can't contradict Scripture, but you can. Scripture Where does the text say that it's about the covenant? Exactly. Because there again, as anytime it's talking about through Christ, it's talking about the covenant. The Father it. alone is the creator. Um, it's through Christ that everything is, is made. It's talking about the covenants. The heaven and okay. earth, which is called um, Israel is a representation of Israel. It's not a contradiction. Where, where does it use the phrase heaven and earth? And you, I mean, you keep saying scripture can't contradict itself. Nobody uh, disagrees Isaiah with you on that. Two. What I think Isaiah can one, contradict scripture is a oneness interpretation. So give me a sound grammatical, syntactical, contextually driven interpretation of Genesis 1, or excuse me, John 1, 3, where it says all things became through him. Dia to egeneta. 
Prove to me that that's talking about the covenant. Prove well, to me that again, it's talking, talking about. about hold on, John one three is talking about the word. Everything that's right. comes through. The, everything comes through the word. What is the word? The word is the Old Testament. What is oh, God's wait, word? So, it's the Old Testament. <laughs> okay, so the word is the Old Testament. So in the beginning, what? the Old Testament was that's with the Father. Literally. Wait a minute. Right. In the beginning, in the beginning Fine. was the Old What's Testament. The Okay, guys. All right, what, all right, guys. All right, we have to be. Have, uh, hold, Stacy, 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 Stacy. Hold on, hold on. We have to. Uh, in order to respond to the question, we got a lot of questions to be fully asked. Um, let's not talk over each other. That said, uh, your time is up, Anthony. We're about to transition to the twenty-minute open discussion. This is going. <laughs> this is going to be. You guys got to take it easy. Let's ask a question. Respond to the question because the audience wants to hear what you guys have to say as well. So. You guys are now in 20 minute open discussion. You guys have the floor. All right. Uh, let me let me say this. First of all, in Stacy's defense, it might be the case that Stacy can't tell when I start talking. There might be a little bit of a, a lag or something that's tech, technological or something. But uh, OK, that's just I'm just trying to be magnanimous. I don't know if that's the case or not, or Stacy is just uh, going on. But uh, well, it's, Stacey, it is behind by about three or four seconds. You're right. OK, um, so I. I'm fine continuing this discussion if you want to, or we can transition to something else. Oh, let's go else. on to something else. Because as usual, okay. you're like, go ahead. like I said, you're gonna talk about those five verses and you're not gonna you're not gonna answer any of my questions. Let's go to some let's go to answer some questions here. Okay. Like go I ahead. said, it's his why is it the Father Spirit in us and in Jesus? Where's the Trinity? Where's this sharing of the Spirit anywhere? It's singular, it's his spirit. I'm not even sure I get your argument. The The Bible distinguishes between Father, Son, and Spirit. If, it's sim if the Spirit simply is the Father, there's no need for this uh, term or for it to be used repeatedly as a way of distinguishing. I mean, you have conjunctions used with Father and Spirit and Spirit. You have uh, words like also, another, other, uh, in addition, you know, besides, uh, all these terms are used. Those terms wouldn't be used if the Father is the Spirit. You wouldn't have the Father uh, sending the Spirit. You wouldn't have Scripture, uh, you know, talking about God doing things through the Spirit repeatedly. It wouldn't tell us to pray to the Father through the Son in the Spirit if the Spirit simply is the Father. None of that makes sense on modalism. It clearly says the Father is the Spirit. What do you do with the Father is the all in all, the Spirit? Where does it say that the Father is the Spirit? It's His. It says His Spirit, His Holy Spirit. Okay, so now you're changing the lingo here. That's fine with me. Uh, okay. It is His Spirit, okay. but, but the, the Spirit is also called the Spirit is also called Christ's Spirit. But you said Christ is simply a human being. So are you saying that Christ's humanity is the Spirit? Who is Christ's Spirit? Uh, no, follow the argument here. You were the one who said I, that because the Father calls the Spirit his Spirit, and yes. if Jesus as the Son simply refers to his humanity and he refers to the Spirit as his Spirit, then by the, by the force of your own logic, the Spirit would have to be Christ's humanity. That's your argument. I'm just making you stick to it. Well, Christ told you who, his, who, who Christ say his Spirit was. <laughs> Uh, he said he's the spirit who comes from the Father. He said he's the spirit yeah. that he would send from the Father, Acts chapter 2. He said that he is another, John 14, right? That's who Jesus said the spirit is. <clears throat> and if we can look at the whole Bible, not just limited to what Jesus said, the spirit is identified as the one who is sent forth at the creation of the world uh, in Psalm 14430 to create it. He's the one who renews the face of the earth. He's the one who brooded over the surface of the waters. Uh, so the spirit's routinely I identified as a divine person and distinguished as such from father and son. The spirit. So you're saying that God is is different spirits. No, uh, if you're if you're using the term spirit as a personal name, which is how it's being used for the third person of the Trinity, uh, then he's not the Holy Spirit. If you're using it to refer to what the Father is by nature, spirit, that's different. All three persons share the one undivided essence or spirit of deity. But the Holy Spirit is a personal designation. 
right? You're confusing terminology. When John 4, 24, for example, says God is spirit, it's talking about what the Father is by nature. It's not referring to his identity, but to his nature, his essence. So it's not a reference to the Holy Spirit as such, as that uh, personal denominator. Uh, but what do you do with the fact that, well, for example, if you think the Spirit simply is the Father, how do you account for the fact that 1 Corinthians 2 says the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God? If the Spirit simply is the Father, why does it speak of him uh, searching or plumbing the depths of, of the Father's being? Because the Spirit is spoken of as God in action, so it's like his arm. Your arm waits for your brain to tell it what to do. Um, John 16 says the spirit doesn't talk on its own. It, it waits and it, it does what it's told. It's this in the old Testament, Wait, it's so, called the arm of God. So, so if, that, if the father is, is the, the spirit, the spirit, if the father is the spirit, yes, why is he Father's telling the spirit, spirit what to do? Because your brain tells your arm what to do. It's Hebrews use physical body parts to explain the omnipresent spirit. You can't explain the omnipresent spirit. So they use physical body parts. So they said the arm is the spirit. So where, where, where does um, it or say they'll that the spirit, say, or they'll say his spirit. That where does it say that the spirit. spirit where does it say that the spirit is his arm? Well look at Isaiah six Isaiah sixty three and sixty four is full of um It doesn't refer to the uh, spirit there as his arm, it's referring to the angel of the Lord, the coming Messiah. It talks about with my own arm I brought salvation. Right, and it doesn't say with my own arm who is the Holy Spirit I brought salvation. You're reading that into no, the text. No, but but he sent his spirit. Him, He's the spirit that, remember it says his spirit, I will send my spirit in it, the it service. Says, yeah, it says not only that he would singular. send the spirit, but also that he would send his son or uh, the servant of the Lord. In uh, uh, Isaiah 63, it mentions that God saved Israel by the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is distinguished in the context from the Father who sends him and the angel of his presence. In the context, it's the coming Messiah who's identified as the arm of the Lord. Uh, you'll find that in Isaiah 63, verse 5. I looked, and there was no one to help, and I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and right. my wrath upheld me. But it doesn't say that about the Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact, I can prove that even further. In Isaiah 63, 11, it speaks of the Holy Spirit as the one that was that the Father put within Moses. But then it speaks of the arm of the Lord as the one who went at Moses' right hand. So the Spirit was placed within Moses, and the arm of the Lord, the angel of his presence, went at Moses' right hand. Yes, and it, the Spirit is his Spirit, as Isaiah 63, 11 says. And the Spirit again, is Christ's Spirit, the as the Old Testament repeatedly and, says, and but you don't think the Spirit is, is Jesus' spirit. humanity. Right? You're, you're falling spirit back on an argument spirit. that I already showed to be notoriously fallacious. If you say that the Father calling the Spirit his Spirit means that the Spirit simply is the Father, then the Christ, the Son, which you say just refers to his humanity, calling the Spirit his Spirit means the Spirit is his humanity. That's fallacious. I don't know of any heresy, right? Modalism is its own heresy, but I don't know of any heretic who ever said that. When we're talking about the Spirit, we're talking about the one Spirit called God the Father. That's, that's, the spirit that's that your in, assertion. I, when I'm talking about the Holy said, Spirit, I'm well, talking about one of those say? persons they who share the same divine essence. Jesus told you, he, okay, John 14, 7 through 10. Who did Jesus say he was? Uh, in John 14, are you serious? I, I, uh, I yeah, I'm be... serious. Okay, who well, in John... Philip, Jesus in John... can't lie. Uh, that's right. So in John 14, 1, where Jesus, who can't lie, says to believe in God, referring to his Father, and also in me, also. In 14, 6, he says he's the way to the Father. He doesn't say, I am the Father. In 14, he, 11, he says he's in the Father. Uh, throughout, he says, uh, he, he distinguishes between himself in the Father. Uh, so I'm not sure why you're turning to that text. The distinguishing is the physical body that is the sacrifice, the lamb. The God in Jesus, though, is the Father. That's what he said. Uh, prove said, prove that a, a, a body did, did is say, not... Show us the Son. 
Jesus is not distinguishing between a physical body and his spiritual nature. He says that we are to believe, I mean, think of what your interpretation reduces these passages to. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in my divine nature. Believe also in my human nature. In my divine nature's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, my human nature would have told you, for my human nature goes to prepare a place for you. Uh, you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, uh, you know, where are you going? Jesus said, my human nature is the way, my human nature is the truth, my human nature is the life. No one comes to my divine nature but through my human nature. Uh, if you knew me or my human nature, you would have known my divine nature also. All of this just makes gobbledygook of what Jesus is saying in John 14. That's not nothing what I'm saying. I asked you a simple question. Who is Jesus saying he is in John 14, 7 through 10? Okay, well, Philip let's look said, at it. Then. Noah's the father. Did Jesus say, No, I'm God the Son? No, he also didn't say, I am the father. Uh, but he does distinguish himself as the oh, son here. He, he said, says, How long have I been looking If you had known me, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. There's that right. word also again. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip you said to him, Lord, him. Show us the father. Listen. And it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you? And yet you have not come to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, will, I, but the father abiding in me does his works. The father is that I am in the, the father, not I am the father, and the father is in me, not the father is me. Uh, that's wordplay. You're dodging everything it's saying. You're not I'm, answering. I'm simply, but you I'm simply quoting point. it. You brought up a good point. You said, in my father's house. I bring up a lot of good points. Stick in around. I'll be here the rest house. of the debate. Guess, guess whose house is heaven? The father's house. The God of the Bible. It didn't yeah, say the Trinity's house. It, you're not going to find it's the son's house. It's the father's house. Uh, yeah. You, you, you're talking about word games. I'm quoting the text. You have to keep altering the language. I'm quoting the text. When Jesus, you're dodging. When Jesus said, in my father's house are many dwelling places, he's saying it's his father's house. It's that father's doesn't mean house. it's not yeah, also but... the son's house because the house so that it belongs to a father also belongs to the son who shares his very nature and therefore is the heir of all things that belongs to his father. That's the his point that's made in Colossians 1, in Hebrews 1. It's made repeatedly throughout Scripture. The son as whose son spirit is heir is of in all Jesus. things. The father, <laughs> spirit is in Jesus. The father, the father uh, spirit and the father spirit's going back. It's not uh, a where, God the son Where does spirit? it say There's the father spirit, spirit is going back? You keep saying, you keep telling Jesus. me, you keep telling me what language is not used there when I only need to use the language that's found there. But then you keep importing or smuggling in language that's not found there or anywhere else in the Bible. Where does All Jesus say the father's spirit is going back to him? John 16, 28. I came from the Father. I'm going back to the Father. He's yeah, but he doesn't say he doesn't say that the Holy Spirit is the Father who's going back to the Father. He says in John 16, 28, I came forth from the Father. So he was from the Father, I not who a came Trinity. from the Father. He existed with the Father That's as an I, as a personal subject. I came forth from the Father, and I have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. That's what John 16, 28 says. He's talking it about the Spirit. The that Son is a personal from subject from the Father. What came from heaven? The Father hovered Mary and put his Spirit in Jesus. That's Where does it say that he put the Holy Spirit inside of Jesus? Luke 1, 35, the Spirit of God is in Jesus. That's not That's what it says. Go ahead and read the text. That's the incarnation. I'll, I'll read the text for you. In 135, it says, The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. It does not say that the personal subject of the conception is the Holy Spirit. The no, Father's the physical is not. I completely agree. God is not a man or son of man. Numbers 23, 19. Spirit does not okay. have flesh and flesh and bones. So I agree with that. But I'm talking where does about it say, where does it say that the spirit was put inside Jesus and that's the subject who's being incarnated? 
No, I'm saying he's born from the Holy Spirit. So if he's born from the Holy Spirit, he isn't the Holy Spirit. No, his spirit is the Holy Spirit. There's a difference. Where does it say that in the text? Where does it say in the text that his spirit is the Holy Spirit? It don't have to say that. It's the Spirit's the Father's Oh, it doesn't have spirit. to say that. The we just make it up as we go along. <laughs> no, the Come on, Stacy. You, you've got to see that your oneness spirit. theology has you flailing all over the place here. You, 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 you really want, you really want to be able to say that I'm adding to the text, that I'm twisting things. But we've seen the only person adding and twisting things is you. And I'm saying this for your own good. I'm not saying this to be mean or cantankerous or anything else. I'm saying it because these are God's these spirit. are momentous issues, issues of life and death. Okay, you need to deal honestly with the text, and I mean. Honor God. I mean, it, uh, just Honor bow God. to the word. My spirit will be on the servant. Singular. My spirit that will be on it. the servant or he'll be in yeah. the servant. On my the my servant. spirit will be on him or in him. My spirit will be on the servant. Okay. So. Uh, but it's singular. <laughs> Once again, you're dodging. You're trying to do the word. This is tri typical Trinitarian. You'll what am I dodging? Three verses, but you will what am I dodging? The rest of scripture because nothing Are you backs, dodging, nothing pointing out what I'm allegedly dodging? No God what am I dodging, Stacey? It doesn't talk about it. Let's talk it about it. doesn't talk about what? What spirit it does. was in Jesus. It's clearly the Father's spirit. That was the prophecy. Where does that it say the Father's spirit, the Holy Spirit, was in Jesus? That's all you got to do, Stacy. Game one. I'm saying... That's the prophecy, Isaiah 42, 1. Isaiah 42 says, I'll place my spirit on him. It doesn't say that my spirit would be incarnated and would be in him. Well, it's the spirit that guides him. Jesus said it's the Father. So the, the spirit work. guides him. If, if you have a guide, you're not the guide. The guide is someone other than yourself. If the spirit's guiding him, the spirit is not him. But he is the anointed. That's what anointed means. He is anointed with what? He's anointed with the Father. Once it doesn't again, say with the Father. Wait, okay, give me one text where. Give me a single text where it says he's. Even, give me a single text where it says he's anointed with the Father. Stacy, Stacy, I don't mean to speak while you're interrupting. Give me a verse that says what you just said. Give me a verse that says he was anointed with the Father. What does uh, Christ mean? anointed it, it doesn't mean anointed with the father <laughs> it doesn't have to all the scriptures oh it doesn't have to say your theology how, how many it times are you going to admit to. in this discussion the that your theology doesn't to. have to be stated in the bible how all many times are you going to admit that your the theology father. doesn't have to be stated in the bible once again all the fullness came from the father quit dodging everything i'm saying it's the father's <laughs> spirit it's his <laughs> spirit i mean you can laugh you're losing the argument it's the father every time. <laughs> it's the All right, guys. All right, guys. Listen, listen. listen. The All right, All right guys. The we, we, in Christ. we got about three and a half minutes left, man. Let's let's settle down. Right. Look, let's focus in. Let's focus in. <laughs> I, I don't even know where to go from here. Stacy, you can't the tell Washington me I'm dodging Washington. if I keep asking you to justify the statements that you're making and then you repeatedly respond by saying it doesn't have to say that. Well, if, if you're just going to say it doesn't have to say that, then you shouldn't debate, right? It says uh, uh, every should I, should I the say, should I start spirit. playing? Here, I'm going to do tit for tat. What question would you like me uh, to ask me, Stacy? I'm going to play your game. Go ahead. Ask Colossians me a question. 119. Colossians 1.19. Who is it that fills himself in Jesus? Who is the okay, who, gave, who gave the fullness? It doesn't have to say what I believe, right? It's just I believe it. It doesn't who have to say it. I know you lost the argument. I know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> so wait, now because I'm now I'm repeating answer. your form of argumentation, and you say I've lost the argument. I'm sorry, but once again, you can't describe it because okay. the entire Bible says God, the Father, Spirit, is in Jesus, is in us. It, he Where is does the it full, say, he put the fullness. It says the Father, Colossians 119, the Father's house. It's the Father, God the Father. Jesus we already talked about that. God, the, we, we God already talked is about, the okay. Father in Scripture. 
So Is I've been magnanimous me? here, what? Stacey, and I've what? let you kind of direct the course of this particular conversation. Now let me ask you a question. You said in all the apostolic salutations that Jesus is distinguished from the Father, and the distinction has in view uh, a distinction between the deity of the Father and the humanity of the Son. Is that correct? No, they're showing you, yes, that Jesus is the okay. Christ yes. that is anointed with the Father. They're, what what do you do with Peter? What do you do then with Peter's opening salutation, where he said, to those who have received a faith of the same kind of as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in God the Father and of Jesus our Lord. Here, the Father is called God, and Jesus is called God, and both are distinguished from each other in a salutation, which you said always distinguishes between the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus, spoken of under the terms Father and Son. How do you deal with this text? Um, you just twisted the entire thing. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once you're, again, Peter you're not, is even, you're not even reading the verse, uh, Stacy. I hope you're not going from memory. You're not quoting the verse I quoted. No, I, you I said all the salutations, all the salutations in, in the epistles distinguish yeah. between the Father and the Son, meaning the humanity and deity of the Son not between right. two persons who are God. I just quoted 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, where the Son and the Father are both distinguished from each other, and both are called God. Um, where does it say Jesus is called God at? Uh, well, you should have come to the debate having already read the Bible, uh, but it's yeah, in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, 1, 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 through 2. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 okay, through 2. I'm in 1 Peter. That. Okay, well, Second Peter comes after that. Hold on a second. Hey guys, we're, time has actually expired. Um, so we're going to uh, just conclude the, the cross examination. <laughs> you guys are, you guys are, uh, are in it, in it deep, man. Good stuff, good stuff. So now we're gonna to transition to our second round of rebuttals, which is seven minutes. So that says, Stacy, you're up for your seven minute rebuttal, second rebuttal. All right, let me know when you're ready and I'll start your time. Yeah, go ahead. All right, you got it for seven minutes. Okay. Once again, um, if Jesus is all did not lose his um, godship or lordship, however, wait a minute. What? So I'm not. I'm just talking for seven minutes. That's uh, a seven minute rebuttal. Yes, seven minute rebuttal. Okay. Um, all right. So as you can see in this debate, all I've shown is that it's the Father in the Old Testament that is promising that he would be in or upon this. I know Anthony tries to not discuss the scriptures by arguing on or in, or um, Jesus said the father's in him. The old Testament says it's upon him. Either way, the spirit God in Christ is the father's spirit. It says that in every passage, Jesus said, I came to reveal the father. There's nothing about a Trinity or a God, the son in the entire Bible. It's about the father. Um, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Who's the father. He's the form of the father. That's the whole point of scripture that God was going to come, um, with his own arm, um, uh, with his own spirit to be savior. Um, and Isaiah he says, I alone am savior. I alone am God. There's none beside me. Um, if you got a Trinity, there's somebody beside him. Um, it, it's always in the singular, thousands and thousands of times. And it's, Jesus and the apostles confirm this. They say, God the Father, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, we have one God, the Father. He is the one in Christ. That's why he's called Christ. He's anointed with the Father. It never says a God the Son. That is an implied invention complete invention that was forced on centuries of people by murder and and by banishment um it does not hold up the scripture the god in scripture is clearly the father 
um, we we worship Christ to the glory of the Father. It's all about the Father because He's the one in Jesus. Is there is no God the Son? There's no Trinity in the Bible. It's not talked about. The Holy Spirit. Once again, the Holy Spirit is the Father's Spirit. It's just a way of um, the Hebrews express God in action. It's His power. It's His Holy Spirit. Himself. He's the omnipresent. The heavens can't contain him. He's everywhere. He's above all. He's in all. He's through all. The one spirit, as Ephesians 4 tells us. And Paul is clear. It's the God and Father is, is, the, is the Father. God is the Father. Jesus is the Christ. Um, once the physical's done, he hands the kingdom to our God and Father. 1 Corinthians 15 23 through 28 because the father is the God in heaven. It's the father's house um, He operates through the Son. That's why it always says through the Son um, God came um, Through the Son 2nd Corinthians 5 19 and reconciled the world It's the father filling the Son with his fullness Colossians 1 19 Never is a Trinity taught if there's a Trinity, it's got to say our spirit or us are in him. Never in scripture. The, and we didn't talk about it. The only passages that talk about um, God being a, in the plural as far as us is the uh, verses that has angels in his presence. Like Genesis 1, 26, um, Isaiah 6. Um, the angels are in his presence because God uses the angels to, to do his uh, work in the Old Testament. Angel of the Lord, guess what? That's the physical. He's the invisible in the angel of the Lord. That's the whole point. It's not a separate person from the Father. He's the invisible in the angel of the Lord, speaking through the angel, speaking through the prophets. It's his word. The word was in the beginning with God. It wouldn't say a word if it was God the Son actually there. It's nowhere in Scripture. God creates the covenant through the Son. That's what it talks about. Heaven and earth is, is recognizing the covenants. Um, um, scripture uses um, the celestial to explain kingdoms. Uh, remember Joseph, um, he had a dream, said the sun, moon, and stars bowed down to him. Well, Jacob immediately knew he was talking about him, his wife, and his and his brothers uh, because Israel recognized the heavenly as kingdoms it's the same thing with heaven and earth Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth the spiritual and the physical and the invisible he's the the, the covenant is through him the old and the new covenants that's why I said like I said he's called the root and the offspring of David he's the he's the first and the last but Isaiah is clear the Father is the only creator of the physical. Um, he appointed creation, um, the covenants through the Son, Psalms 8, 6. And he, when he's talking about the Son, he says, He will be to me a Son. I will be to him a Father. Future tense. If there's a Son standing there, you can't say that um, he's already a Son. He says, the Son, future tense. He will be to me a Son. He's not going to be. He's not going to lie to the audience or the writers. He's clear. He's coming in a man. That's why he's called a son. Anytime you see this term "son" in Scripture, it has um, the Spirit upon it. Um, it's why we're called sons of God in Scripture. Um, in the angels, we're called sons of God in the Old Testament. The sp anytime there's a spiritual being or spiritual applied to it, that is called the son. The difference in Christ is. Um, he was full of the Father. He, he wasn't born of a man. Um, God occupies that body to, to be with us, to show himself. Jesus is the image, but he's the image of the Father. No God the Son in Scripture anywhere, not mentioned, not one time. It's the Father, hundreds of times. It's always the Father. And the last two words, he can't knock anything I'm saying because it's what the Scripture says. Holy Spirit is the Father's Spirit. It's His own Spirit. It's not a separate Spirit. If He's not the Father, then you've right. got more than one Spirit. That, that's one time spirit. right there. All right, Anthony, you're up for your seven-minute rebuttal. Let me uh, get your time ready, and 
You can go for it. All right, you got it, Anthony. I think you're muted, Anthony. Yeah, I think I, I lost your vocals. Yeah, I still don't have anything, Anthony. Yeah, it's still not coming through. Uh, still, yeah, still nothing, uh, Anthony. So hold on, Ant hello everyone. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, we're still not getting anything, Anthony. We see you and everything, but we're not hearing you. If you logged out, he's gonna try to come back in. That hopefully will restore his audio. That said, everyone, um, we uh, while we wait for Anthony to come back in. Hello, Anthony. Yeah, there you go. I think you're back now, Anthony. Anthony, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Anthony? Can you hear us? Anthony, you there? Anthony, can you hear us? Anthony, you there? Hmm. I think we just heard him. I Don't can hear talk. you, Anthony. We can hear you, but I'm trying to figure out: Can you hear us? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't think he can hear us. Oh, I thought I heard him make a noise. Yeah, I can, we can hear him, but he can't hear us Hello. for whatever reason. Uh, yeah, you can. We can. We can hear you. We can hear you, but you can't hear us. Hello, hello. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you, but oh, you, you can't hear us. Yeah, we can hear now you. Now I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Now. All right. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um. Well, would that nice. have been considered a forfeit? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You got seven minutes for your rebuttal, Anthony. Okay, so Stacy keeps saying repeatedly, even though I've refuted him on this point and he's never responded to the points that I've been making, he keeps saying that Scripture never identifies the Son, qua Son, as the Son, as a person in distinction from the Father independently of or prior to the Incarnation. And yet in my opening presentation, I gave a litany of passages showing just that. The Son is with the Father in eternity before the world became, John 17, 5. It was through the Beloved Son that the world was created, Colossians 1, 15 and following. Uh, the same thing is said about the Spirit as eternal in distinction from the Father and the Son in Hebrews 9. I pointed out that the Son is also responsible for creation together with the Father and the Spirit. Uh, numerous passages, Hebrews 1, 2, Hebrews 1, 10, uh, 110, in fact, quotes Psalm 102, which is clearly talking about the physical creation. Uh, the Spirit also is identified as creator in distinction from the Father who sends him forth in Psalm 104.30. I pointed out that the Son and the Spirit are active with the Father in the works of providence prior to the incarnation. In John 5.17 and 18, Jesus said that he has been wor at work with the Father throughout the past up until the present. 
I pointed out that the Spirit was actively engaged in providence in Genesis 1-2, upholding the world. Uh, Psalm 104-30, he's the one who renews creation, and he does so as one sent from the Father. So these distinctions are not distinctions derived from uh, the incarnation of Christ. The incarnation is the incarnation of a distinct person known as the Son, who is indeed eternal by virtue of all the passages that I mentioned. We talked a little bit about John 1 in our interchange, and Stacy was just flailing all over the place here. Uh, John repeatedly identifies the Word as a person in distinction from the Father. He says the Word was with God, not that he was in God. Stacy even had to try and change the, the prepositions here in order to squeeze his theology or smuggle it into the text of Scripture. But that left him with a contradiction because John 1, 1 says the Word was with God, and then Stacy said, that God was the Word, but that would mean that the Word, which Stacy thinks is in the Father, actually is the Father. So the Father is in the Father, but that's just gobbledygook. Uh, we, I've also pointed out uh, the numerous times that Jesus, during his earthly ministry, distinguishes between himself and the Father and the Spirit using personal terms to indicate the nature of this distinction. In, in John 6, 32 and 33, uh, Jesus speaks of being given by the Father out of heaven. So in order to be given, you have to exist at the point of being given. Since he's given from the Father out of heaven, he existed with the Father in heaven. The same language is used for the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is sent from the Father, 14.26 of John, John 15.26. The Spirit is sent from heaven. If the Spirit simply is the Father, then who is it that's sending the Spirit? An angel? Now, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what... Uh, uh, Stacy actually believes, not because I thought that going into this, but because of things that he said in the course of this debate. You'll notice that Stacy, when referring to Genesis 126, says that the Father was speaking to the angels when he said, let us make man in our image. If Stacy's consistent with his own statement there, then he thinks the angels are our creators. And so it would make sense if Stacy thinks that the Spirit is sent from heaven by the angels. But of course, that's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that the Spirit was sent by the Father, and he's also sent by the Son. He's sent by the Father and the Son. Scripture repeatedly distinguishes between these persons. Genesis 1.26 is not a reference to angels. It's a reference to the members of the Trinity. That's not only how the church has classically understood it, long before the people that uh, Stacy calls murderers to try and uh, you know, poison the well, uh, the people who taught this unanimously throughout the early centuries of the church were all martyrs who were subject to the cruelty of the empire. They weren't the Arians who in the fourth century got the ear of the emperor and then started turning the political tables on Christians and were having them driven into exile and having them murdered. Most people don't know that the history of heresy and of persecution uh, as much involved uh, her heretics like Arius and others who deny the true deity of the Son uh, you know, even though this is a claim they like to lay at the feet of the Orthodox. Uh, he, you know, Stacy uh, seems to think in this debate that it can be conducted simply by making assertions. Much of his time is spent just making assertions. Other time it's spent uh, swapping out terms like with meaning in or on meaning in or, uh, you know, the father's house meaning, you know, whatever Stacy thinks it means. The scriptures don't teach Stacy's theology. That's why Stacy has to engage in these sorts of uh, exegetical antics. He's like an exegetical cat on hot textual bricks or like a, a gecko on the desert sand that can't keep its feet on the ground at the same time because it's too hot. There are texts of scripture that distinguish between the Son and the Father and this distinction is personal, while at the same time identifying both as God, such as 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, the passage I mentioned uh, before that Stacy uh, wasn't familiar with prior to this debate, apparently. In that text, both persons are called God and both persons are distinguished. You also have passages which refer to the Son in the Old Testament. For example, Proverbs 30, verse 4, uh, it, it says, uh, well, I mean, Psalm 30, verse, uh, but Proverbs 30, verse 4 says uh, about the Father and the Son, it says, who has ascended into heaven and descended who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and his son's name? Surely you know. Here the author of Proverbs 30, uh, Agur, refers to God and his son and ascribes to both of them divine actions. This is in the Old Testament. The New Testament itself, reflecting back on the Old, says that the Son was present and active during the Old Covenant period. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says it was Jesus who led the people 
uh, and was the rock who nourished them. In 1 Corinthians 10, 9, Paul says that Jesus is the one who sent fiery serpents among them when they rebelled. Uh, in Hebrews 11, it says that Moses suffered reproach by identifying with Christ. Uh, and in all of these texts, Jesus is distinguished from the Father. He's not conflated with or identified as the Father. Uh, oh, I mean, uh, I mean, I really don't know where else to go with uh, some of this. Stacy uh, uh, doesn't seem to be at home with uh, exegesis. Uh, he doesn't have any problem changing the terms that are being used. He doesn't have any problem, frankly, admitting that the text doesn't have to say what he believes, right? He could just assert this uh, dicta on his own authority, and that just makes it true. Uh, All right, and, that's and time. This is from that's time right there. All right, now we're going to transition to our closing remarks. Uh, once again, these closing remarks will be five minute closings. So, Stacy, you're up for your closing remarks. All right, Stacy, you got it for five minutes. All right. Um, once again, all I heard there was dodging. He, he never answered any of my questions on who God is, which is what this debate's about. Um, saying, well, they mentioned the Son, they mentioned the Father. Well, of course they did. The Son was here. He's it was person. In the Old Testament, he's mentioned. He's prophecy. The question is, who is God? And God is the Father. That's who he's is God in the Old Testament. That's who came in the New Testament. Clearly, God clearly said His Spirit. He was coming. Singular, everything. There's never a God the Son mentioned doing anything in Scripture. It's, it's all prophecy. The Spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's about His life when He was here. He's the Messiah, the, the mediator, the man, the Savior, but the God upon him, in him, whatever Anthony wants to say, that which he's dodging, is the Father. It's always the Father. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Um, it's always the Father in Scripture. Um, there's just, it was complete and total dodging. Um, uh, Jesus was clear. The Father was the one in him doing the works. He was specific. No he Hebrew writer, anybody recognized any, they didn't know knew of no other God but the Father in Scripture. Nobody believed in this Trinity stuff, putting stuff together and making them separate persons. To say that the Holy Spirit is not the Father, that's blasphemy. That that's that's utter ridiculousness is saying that the Holy Spirit is not the Father. That is just completely ignoring the entire Bible. It's clearly the Father Himself in action. It's His Spirit. Um, to make up these terms, just because somebody taught you something and it looks right, doesn't make it right if, until you study Scripture and prove it. If it's not in Scripture, then it's, an, it's a false teaching. And our churches, when they were formed, got rid of some false teachings. They got rid of... Um, you know, baptizing babies and um, purgatory, uh, praying to Mary. But there was other things they needed to get rid of, and they kept. And they were completely unbiblical and undermines what the scriptures are about. And it's about the one Savior, God, who is going to come in a man, the one Lord. You have to have one Lord. You can't have two. If Jesus isn't the Father completely, a separate being, that's two lords. There's no way around it. No matter what you say, if your teachings is two lords, it's two lords. The scriptures is clear as one lord. And it's the father that came in a man. That's the lord of scripture. That's why Jesus is called anointed, the Christ. He was filled with the father. The father's good pleasure filled the son. Um... It's always about God the Father everywhere in Scripture. It's just, there's no way around it when somebody presents it to you other than to dodge it and just go under, go over semantics about wordplay. Um, the Bible's clear, and Anthony never touched on the Spirit in the Old Testament. It's always singular. 
It was God's Spirit in us, through us, above us. It's the Father, the one Spirit, the one Lord. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 is clear. The man handed the kingdom to our God and Father, the Spirit. He's the spiritual, he, he's reigning over the spiritual kingdom, the Father. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28. Scripture's clear. There's nothing, there's nothing about this God the Son that entered Mary and became a person. It's a complete invention. There's one spirit that entered Mary or came upon Mary, however Anthony wants to spin it. Um, to defeat my argument, he's basically saying Jesus was just a man, if you listen to what he was saying. Um, no, he's guided by that spirit, however you want to say it, in, on, um, it's always the Father that was guiding. Jesus was clear. Jesus can't lie. Philip asked him, just show us the Father. Jesus didn't say, well, you know, I'm God the Son, part of this Trinity. I, I can only tell you about the Father. No, Jesus said, you're looking at the Father. You've been with the Father. Um, it's crystal clear. The Scriptures, is, is a, it's all about the prophecy, the Son that is to come. The Son, that means a, it's a person that's going to have God's presence. Um, all right, Stacy, that's, that's time right there. All right, Anthony, you're up for your closing statement. Let me know you're ready, and I'll start your time. Uh, you're muted, Anthony. Oh, let me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, great. All right, in my opening presentation, I gave numerous arguments demonstrating that Father, Son, and Spirit, which are, first of all, personal and relational terms, refer to eternal distinctions. Stacy has not dealt with the arguments that I gave for that. I pointed to John 17, 5, Colossians 1, both of which speak of Christ as eternal, antecedent to creation. I also pointed to texts that speak of the Spirit as eternal and distinct from Father and Son, such as Psalm 104, 30, which Stacy never touched. I pointed out that Son and Spirit are active with the Father in creation. Colossians 1 again, Hebrews 1, could have also pointed to John 1 or John 1, 10. Uh, numerous passages that speak of the Son active in creation with the Father. The same thing for the Spirit. Uh, the same thing goes for providence. We had no answer to John 5, 17 and 18, which I think I've mentioned four times now, first in my opening statement, then in my rebuttal, then in a subsequent rebuttal. Stacy is not dealing with the main arguments that I gave, much less the uh, ancillary arguments that I've given in the course of the debate. Uh, Stacy still just thinks that it's sufficient to rely on assertions. He's making assertions more than he's arguing. Uh, he engages in question-begging assertions where he assumes what has to be proven. Uh, so his argumentation is circular. He makes contradictory statements such as the word uh, simply is the Father, the word is in the Father, but those two things can't both be true. Uh, and all of these things just riddle his case, and yet uh, he also uh, engaged in straw man. You know, you notice that he just a minute ago said that uh, Anthony is basically saying Jesus is just a man. And yet up until his concluding statement, he keeps saying there's no God the Son in the Bible. So which is it? Anthony thinks there's a God the Son or Anthony thinks Jesus is just a man? Okay, if you reduce to those sorts of tactics in order to try and you know, get yourself out of a pickle, uh, then you, you need to reevaluate your position. And in fact, you really do need to reevaluate your position because according to 1 John, and this is why I consider these debates to be worthwhile, the Apostle John said, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Now, of course, Stacy would say he believes in both Father and Son, but he doesn't mean by that what the Apostle John means. When John refers to Father and Son, he's not referring to two different natures. He's referring to two persons, one of whom has two natures, to be sure, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here he's talking about two personal subjects. He talks about the Son and the Father also. He uses uh, terminology that repeatedly identifies the Son and the Father as two distinct persons. In fact, in 1 John 1, before he ever makes that statement, he says, what we have uh, seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we have fellowship with the Father and fellowship with the Son. 
this clearly indicates that we're talking about two persons here. And so when John in 1 John 2 says that those who deny the Son and do so in any number of ways, one way is the way that Stacy has chosen by simply saying Son refers to humanity, they are in fact identifying themselves as liars and antichrists according to the Apostle John. That's why they're reduced to question begging. That's why they're reduced to making assertions. That's why they're reduced to making contradictory statements. That's why they have to engage in straw man argumentation. Okay? The oneness position isn't found in the Bible. It isn't found in any part of the Bible, whether the Old Testament or the New Testament. Stacy says, I didn't deal with the Old Testament. Well, in the first place, I think both Testaments agree. So even if I only appeal to the New Testament, that would be sufficient. But in fact, I did make reference to the Old Testament. I mentioned Genesis 1-2, Psalm 104-30, Job 33-4, uh, numerous Old Testament texts. I could have easily quoted others. We also talked a little bit about Genesis 1-26, which most certainly is not talking about angels because angels are not our creators and we were not made in their image. Rather, the New Testament tells us that we were made in the image of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit. It does so by saying that we are being renewed into that image which we had fallen from uh, in our first parents in Genesis 3. And when you look at places like Colossians 3 or Ephesians 2 or 1 Corinthians 3, you see that that image into which we are being conformed is the image of the Son, and the one who is conforming us into that image is the Spirit. And so when Genesis 1.26 speaks of, uh, it says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. And the New Testament tells us that uh, we are being conformed to the image of the Son by the Spirit. It clearly identifies who the us and our of Genesis 1.26 are. Uh, you know, we could go on, uh, and I'm sure uh, Stacy would love to, right. uh, but I think my time is up. <laughs> that it is. Great job, you guys. Uh, great debate. And I appreciate you guys for for the feistiness that you guys have and believe in what you believe. You know, I think that makes for a good debate, makes for some uh, some level of care there. Um, with that said, we're gonna jump into this Q and A. We got a bunch of questions for you guys, and I can tell you guys out there in the audience, I would not get to all the questions um, due to time constraints. So I will jump into this. I got a super chat that I will send you guys his way. Oh, yeah. If it comes up, go downstairs. Contribute, it go downstairs. To the, contribute it to the Marlin show. All right, this, uh, hold on one second. Let me pull this thing up real quick. Put the gay up. All right. All right. So, this question for Stacy. Oh. Uh, with the perspective of the Logos, can you explain how the Logos is riding a white horse in Revelation 19, hosting a show after the debate? Quick promotion there. What's your thoughts, Stacey? Um, the log is, is called the word of God on his, on his leg. It's a vision. Um, once again, Jesus fulfills the word of God. Um, He's not, his name isn't Word. Um, it wasn't Word in the beginning. It's all about God's Word is fulfilled when Jesus became flesh, John 1, 14. Um, Revelations, that's, that's just talking about prophecy and Jesus fulfilling that Word. He's the Word of God. He fulfilled all those prophecies and revelations. That's what that's talking about. His name right. is the Word of God. Uh, is basically question. what if you're taking it oh. literally his name's not oh. word of god do we, do we respond afterwards or no i don't know how we're doing yeah this. i actually meant to uh sorry i meant to hash out the rules so uh stay uh the one who's initially getting asked a question gets one minute to respond and then the next person gets one minute to respond as well so um there you go so you get you guys get one minute each to respond to the question so anthony your time now okay well i can be quicker than that uh Stacy said his name is not the word of God. He's simply fulfilling the word of God. And yet the text says he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. All right. All right. Got another super chat here. All right. This is coming from Dr. Bob. Thanks for the super chat. Stacy, do you worship the person of Jesus? Uh, you worship the father as scripture says. Worship God, Revelations 22. Um, it, to the glory of the Father, you worship through Christ. 
Jesus is our Messiah, our mediator. Um, you praise God for Christ and what he did through Christ. Um, it's all, like I said, it's one body. It's one God. But the glory is to the Father um, through Christ. That's what Scripture says. All right. Uh, Anthony? Uh, again, Stacy contradicts the Bible, and in fact, I'll just go to the same book that he just went to. He went to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation clearly tells us that we are to worship Jesus. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Christians are those who, together with the elders, bow down and say amen and worship the Father and the Son, God and the Lamb. Oneness Pentecostals, or I don't think he's a Pentecostal, but oneness people are those who do not say amen, but say we simply glorify the Father and not the Son also. All right. Here's another super chat. Thank you, Otis. Uh, I think this is Otis, who's actually been on the show a couple of times. Thank you for the super chat. Appreciate you. This is for you, Anthony. Second Corinthians 519. Who is God in his verse and who is Christ? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Himself equals one person. Oh, five minutes left. Yeah. What? Put the gate up. Leave oh. her down there. Put the gate oh, up. Leave got... her down there. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, is this for me? No, this is for uh, this is for Anthony. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the preposition in doesn't always refer to location. That's the the, the mistake that people make. Uh, that they're, they're understanding it in a locational sense. Uh, that the Father is in the Son locationally, uh, but that's not necessarily what's going on there. And if you check the commentators, you know, to a man, they're all going to say it's not saying that the person of the Father is the. Uh, hypostasis of the son, the, the person who uh, is the son. That's not what's going on. It's talking about uh, the activity of the father uh, and the son being uh, used, or the father being at work with the son, accomplishing redemption through him. All right. Stacy? All right. Um, just like I said, he dodges everything about who's really in Jesus. It clearly said God reconciling us to himself through Christ. God through. was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Second Corinthians 5.19 clearly says that. That's what it says in every passage of Scripture. It's the Father in the Son, the God in the Son, reconciling the world, which is all the prophecies, all the promises, the one God, the Father, who... The writer of Second Corinthians is Paul, and in First Corinthians, he clearly identifies God as the Father specifically. So, and First Corinthians eight, same thing. Our God is the Father. All right. And here's another question. It says uh, it doesn't say who is two, but I suspect it's for you, Anthony. But I can't. Uh, the way it's phrased, it seems like it's, it would be for you. And John 5, 22 says, The Father judges no one, but has given all the judgment to the Son. How can a Father and the Son be the same person if one judges and, do, and one does not? Uh, actually, I think that's a question better put to Stacy. Uh, okay. The text, right, yeah, the text. I mean, I'll just answer first and let Stacy go. That's fine. Uh, it, it says clearly that the Father doesn't judge anyone, but has given all judgment to the Son. Now, of course, the son's judgment would be perfectly consistent with the father's. So there, it's not talking about any kind of uh, disharmony or anything of that sort. Uh, but it clearly is distinguishing one who is judging as the principal agent and the other who isn't. And one is called the son. The other is called the father. All right. Uh, Stacy. Yeah, this judgment talked about is about, of course, Christ is the one who judges you because you go by by the book of life, not book of life, you're not saved. Um, 
So that's the what it's talking about. The judgment is through the Son. The whole point is salvation through the mediator um, who's the Son, the Messiah. Um, but Scripture also says many places it's the Father who judges. It's the Ancient of Days who comes and judges um, Israel. Um, but there's different passages, and like I say, it's all it's one throne. Um, Jesus sits on it, but the Father's in him, Revelations 22. So um, it doesn't matter how you spend that. It's still, you're judged from the Word of God, as Jesus said. All right. And these questions are heavy, Stacy. So um, sorry about that, Stacy. It says, um, how do you explain away the Father as all-knowing in 1 John 3.20? Uh, son as all knowing John sixteen thirty and the Holy Spirit is all knowing in Corinth Corinth in First Corinthians uh, two ten to eleven. Um. Well, once again, it's the Father. It's, it's all the Father. It's the Father's Spirit in Jesus revealing. Jesus is listening and revealing what the Father's telling him. Um. Technically. Physically, he didn't know all things. He didn't know the time of his coming. Um, but then they realized who he was when he said that he was not going to mediate for them at a time that the Father would love them. And then they said, oh, you're speaking plainly to us now. We know who you are. You know all things. They were recognizing that the Father was the God in him um, in that passage. And, of course, the Holy Spirit is the Father's Spirit. Um so it's all the same. Once again, it's, it's his spirit, singular. Uh, Anthony, what are your thoughts? Yeah, none of that's stated in the text there <laughs> that are brought up. In all those texts, it refers to the Father is all-knowing, to the Son is all-knowing, and to the Spirit is all-knowing. According to Stacy, the Son is not the deity of Jesus, but the humanity. So how is it that the humanity of Christ is described as omniscient? And why is it that the Spirit, as I asked earlier, is described as omniscient in the sense that not he is the Father, but that he is the one who searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Spirit is omniscient in distinction from the Father. So, uh, you know, those texts, are, those are good questions. I, I affirm that, and I don't know how Stacy could possibly uh, affirm that on his oneness position. All right. And here's another super chat. Thank you, Otis, for a super chat. Appreciate you. This is for you, Anthony. Who is God and who is Christ? Okay, well, I don't know. Maybe he missed the debate. <laughs> uh, it, first of all, we have to avoid equivocation. If you're simply using the term God or Christ as uh, personal designations, that's one thing. If you're using the term Christ, for example, as a title, that's different. Understand, I mean, this is not controversial. This is not Anthony playing word games. This is simply Greek grammar. It's something that no competent commentator would deny. The term Christ is sometimes used as a way of referring to his office. Sometimes it's used as a personal designation, as a proper name. So, for example, in uh, uh, Mark chapter 8, uh, Peter refers to Jesus as the Christ. There it's being used as a title. In Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it's being used as a proper name, a compound name, Jesus Christ. Uh, so when it comes to is, is Jesus or who is God and who is Christ, uh, if God is being used as a personal designation uh, for the Father, then it's, it's simply a proper noun being used for the Father. But that's not the way it's always used. Sometimes the term is used to refer to the essential nature of deity, to what the Father is or to what the Son is. And so, for example, in John 1, 1, the second clause, it says, uh, the word was with God, prostan theon. It uses the accusative form with the article. It's articular, so it's being used in this uh, context as a, uh, per, a proper designation for the Father. But in the immediately following clause, it's used as a preverbal predicate nominative. It says, kai theos ein halagos. So theos there, the word God, is being used as a uh, description of Christ's nature. It's telling us who the Son is, what he is qualitatively. So if you're just, uh, you know, grammatically, uh, it depends how you're asking the question. How are you using the term God? How are you using the term Christ? And it's not going to do for Stacy to say, see, he's playing word games. No, I'm playing grammar, syntax, context when I answer all these questions. All right. Uh, Stacy, what are your thoughts, man? 
Um, clearly, this is what they're called in Scripture. God is the Father. Jesus is the Christ because he's anointed with the Father. And that's been the dodge for two and a half hours. Anthony won't admit what the Bible actually teaches. Um, the God is always the Father in Scripture. Jesus is always the Christ, even in heaven. Because he's anointed with the Father. There's one person there that we see. We see his face, singular. There's one Lord. It's Jesus, the image of God. The God is the Father. Eternal life is this, that you believe they believe in you, the only true God, talking about the Father, and Jesus Christ, who you sent. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. That's what the Bible teaches. And I know Trinitarians don't understand the whole Bible, but that's what all the prophecies say. That's what the New Testament says. Every writer agrees. That's what Scripture says. All right. And here's a question for you, Stacy. In light of your assertion that Jesus existed in the morphe of the Father, can you show us the word partar, uh, pater, sorry, in conjunction with morphe in Philippians 2, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Okay, once again, being in the form of God, Paul is the writer. Go back to chapter 1. God is the Father, according to Paul, in every writing Paul has. So what is it saying? Being in the form of the Father is what it's saying did not count it equal, which is the opposite of what Adam and Eve and Satan did. They thought they could be like God. They sinned and fell. Jesus did not think he could be equal, so he lived a holy, sinless life. But the question bids, who is the God in second uh, in Philippians chapter 2, 5 and 6? Ask the writer. The writer's Paul. Paul said it's God the Father. All That's right. the answer. There's no God the Son in the entire Bible, just like I said. Nobody talked about it. It's the Father, just like chapter 1 says. All right, Anthony. Yeah, I talked about that repeatedly in the debate, and Stacy still doesn't seem to, <laughs> to know that I did. Uh, so, in any case, in Philippians 2, verse 5, it says he existed or is existing. It uses the participle, existing in the form of God. It doesn't say pater, father. It says in the form of God. It's referring to the fact that Christ uh, has the nature of God, the essence of deity. And uh, when it goes on to say uh, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, that's not... Yeah, uh, Stacy interpreted that as this, uh, Jesus not trying to get equality like Adam and Eve did. It's, it's making the exact opposite statement. It's saying, you know, although existing in the form of God, he did not consider the equality, it's articular in Greek, the equality that he had with God something to be used to his own advantage. It's not saying he didn't try to get equality that wasn't his. It's saying he didn't use it to his own advantage, but rather humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, that is, taking on the nature of man, and humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this one, who exists in the form of God, it says he did all of this to the glory of God the Father. Now notice then that Stacy's got a whopper of a contradiction on his hands. He says that the Son is the Father, Paul says he exists in the form of God. Stacy says that means he's simply the form of the Father, but then it says he did all of this to the glory of the Father. Those two things just don't go together. Rather, the Son is, as to his essential nature, God, just like the Father, but he's a distinct person who is equal with God, but didn't use that equality to his own advantage, but humbled himself, endured the cross, won salvation for us, and was exalted, hyper-exalted, as the Greek says, to the right hand of his Father. All right. Here's another super chat. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jake, should I say? Thank you, Jake, for the super chat that's coming at you, Stacy. How does Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7 work in the context of the oneness view? Well, once again, God the Father is the Spirit in Jesus. God the Father. That's what Philippians 1 says. God, according to Paul, is the Father. So being in the form of the Father, that's everywhere. Jesus is the image of the Father, Colossians 1, 15. Here he's, he's the form of the Father. 
um, when it's saying that, it's talking about the spirit that's in him. Um, yeah, he humbled himself because the whole uh, context of chapter two is telling us to humble ourselves or the Philippians. He's walked down, even though he was in the he was the father in the flesh. He humbled himself. That's what it's saying. It's not saying anything else. The question of this debate is who's the God in Jesus, or who is God? Was well, the Father? Paul says. Paul says it in chapter one. All right, Anthony. What are your thoughts, man? Translation of what Stacy just said: Jesus humbled himself to himself to be exalted by himself, which of course makes no sense. And happily, it's not what the apostle said. Rather, the apostle says that this uh, that Jesus, existing in the form of God, and by virtue of that having equality with God, didn't use it to his own advantage, as I already said. He humbled himself to the Father, not to himself, and he was exalted by the Father, not by himself. The Son is not the Father. The Father is the one who sent him. The Son is the one who came from the Father, who glorified the Father. And therefore, Christians are those who acknowledge the Father through the Son, not those who conflate the two or confound the persons and say the Son simply is the Father. All right. And here's a super chat. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Walter. Appreciate it. This is for you, Anthony. First Corinthians 12, 11 says that there is one spirit and yet there is the spirit of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Do you believe in three spirits of, the, of God distinct from one another or one spirit? Okay, so I actually dealt with this earlier in the debate. One has to make a distinction between Holy Spirit as a title or denominator of a particular agent in Scripture and the term spirit referring to the essential nature of something. The term spirit is used in various places in the Bible simply to refer to what something is metaphysically, ontologically, right? It's immaterial. It's non-tangible, non-corporeal. Scripture says that God is non-material, non-corporeal. God is spirit in that sense, and in that sense, there's one spirit. That same undivided spiritual essence belongs to all three persons of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, as well as the Father, as well as the Son. So in that sense, there is uh, a one spirit, but there's also only one spirit in the sense of a personal designation. When it says, uh, when it speaks of one spirit, notice that the one spirit used as a name, right, a title for a person, the one spirit is distinguished from the one Lord, and from the Father, who's called the one God here. So this is not a oneness proof text. All right. Stacy, any thoughts? Um, you can't have three persons without being three beings. To say they're one spirit, then you got to say one of them is the brains of that spirit. One of them is, one of them has to be, there's only one spirit. There's only one brain to a spirit. If we're made in the image of God, what are we? Are we three persons? No, we're one person. You have a spirit and you have you have the physical. The spirit is one and it's the Father. That's what Scripture tells you. It's the Father is the Spirit everywhere in Scripture. That's what's been dodged this whole debate. That's the crux of this whole debate is who is God? And God is that spirit, the omnipresent spirit that no man has ever seen. He is the one spirit, as Ephesians 4 exclaim, uh, proclaims to us. It's what the Old Testament says. He is the spirit. He's the spirit in Jesus. He's the spirit in us. His spirit, singular. And it's always the Father. All right. Here's another super chat. This is for Stacy. Zechariah 12.10 says, When they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him. Are the me and him two persons or one? Um, God is clearly talking about himself in Christ. The one hanging on the cross is a man. But the spirit upon Jesus was the father. The father was the one working through Jesus. It's the father that prophesied that he would be in the son, um, upon the son, carrying out, the, he's the savior according to Isaiah. It's all, as, um, Isaiah is clear, it's the Father's the Savior, and he's going to be in this Son. The servant has his spirit, singular. Same thing in um, Isaiah 48, 16. Me and his spirit. Um, it's it's the, From the beginning, it says, I was not secret. It's talking about from the beginning, Jesus was promised. It is God, the Father, in that 
um, man hanging on the cross. That's why he recognizes. Just like in Isaiah uh, 49, 16, it says, um, you know, I've, um, on the palms of, uh, of my hands, um, I've engraved you. So it, it's God showing you it's him and the son. All right, uh, Anthony, any thoughts? All right, first of all, notice that Zechariah 12.10 never uses the word father. That's something Stacy's importing into the text, which just isn't there. It says, I'll pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Now, let's just run with Stacy's interpretation for a moment that this is referring to the father. The father's the one saying that they'll look on me. But notice what the text also says. I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication. If the Spirit uh, is the Father, why does the Father say he's going to pour out the Spirit on those who look to him? No, the text isn't talking about the Father. It's the it's Son true. talking. And in fact, this is explicit by virtue of the fact that the text goes on to say they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only Son. Agape tos huios in the Greek. It's referring to the beloved Son, the term used by the Father speaking about Jesus at his baptism in Mark 1, 9 through 11. All right. I'm sorry, everyone. This will have to be the last question uh, for tonight. I know a lot of you guys had a bunch of questions, but this will have to be the last one. I'm sorry. All right. This is for you, Stacy. Who sent this angel in Revelations 2 6 and Revelations 2 26? God or Jesus? Well, he's talking, it's the revelation of Jesus. Um, um, it's Jesus. Um, sending his angel is god sending his angel go to it's the same person if you go to revelations 22 22 6 says god sent his angel 16 says and jesus sent the angel um it's not two people saying okay you go angel you go angel it's they're the same and that's what revelations is trying to reveal to us is that god is in that son that's why he's called it's called the one Lord um, fulfilling Zechariah 14 9 that's why it says we will see his face Revelation 22 you have a throne and you have Jesus the Lamb God is in Christ the glory is in Christ um, that's why it's singular we'll see his face it's always that in Scripture it's God and Jesus is the is the, 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 the uh, ability to be with God but they both are said to have sent the angels, is what I'm saying. But um, they're one and the same. All right. Um, Anthony? <laughs> I, I think I'm going to be content just to repeat something that Stacy just said. He says they both sent the angel. I couldn't agree more. Both. Two. Not one person. Two. Both sent the angel. Both were responsible for this personal action of sending uh, the angel. All right. All right. Uh, I did. I just had a super chat come flying in and I don't like to see leader super chats hanging. So this, the, this is the last question. Um, Chris Claus, thank you for the super chat question for Stacy in John chapter eight, verse 30. Jesus says, you are trying to kill me. This Abraham didn't, this Abraham did not do. How could Abraham have tried to kill Jesus? When eight, um, Jesus is referring to being um, before Abraham. So he, and he was so he was talking about the Father as eight twenty seven says. Um, I'm trying to think about what this verse is saying. Um, what your your screen's blurry? Did you say eight ten? It says John eight chapter eight verse forty. Oh, eight verse forty. Mm-hmm. You are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. Um, well, Abraham, I guess, is talking about Isaac. Um, Isaac being symbolic for Jesus. Um, he was. He took Isaac up and was going to sacrifice provided the lamb um 
it's not um i don't see where it's talking about jesus actually being being able to be there with abraham it's clearly talking about um the father the whole chapter eight is talking about being before abraham as being the father the i am um, of exodus which is clearly the father <clears throat> so I, I i'm trying to figure out what his question means all right um you good stacy or yeah all right anthony any thoughts all right, yeah, contextually, Jesus is identifying himself as existing prior to Abraham and therefore as one who could be known by and was known by Abraham. That's why the Jews at the end of the chapter are so irk and say, you're not even 50 years old, and you know you think you know Abraham. So it's not a reference to Abraham and the binding of Isaac, the Akita. It's a reference to the appearance of God to Abraham, and Jesus is identifying himself as that man who appeared to Abraham with two angels. Jesus is saying, you're trying to kill me, and you're showing, therefore, that you're not true children of Abraham because Abraham didn't try to do this. That is, he didn't try to kill me. Now, the, in the context, he's not calling himself the father, as Stacy keeps asserting. Uh, Stacy says uh, that Jesus said in verse, uh, uh, he, well, he said at some point, at verse 27, uh, they didn't realize that he'd been speaking to them about the father. So Stacy claims that's what he's talking about throughout this entire context, but he's playing games here and skipping verses. What it says is in verse 24, Jesus called himself the I am. And then they said uh, to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what I've been saying to you from the beginning, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They didn't realize that he had been speaking to them about the father. In other words, Jesus is saying that it's the father who sent him. Okay. So Stacy uh, tried to make that verse refer to what's going on throughout this entire context, but that's just not the case. It's, it's explaining the sending statement. It's the Father who sent Jesus. That's who Jesus is referring to when he speaks of somebody sending him. All right. All right, guys, that's it. I appreciate you guys for coming on and taking time out your busy schedules to enjoy this debate with me. Uh, the, the audience, appreciate you guys. You guys did great. And um, I thank you guys, man, for, for doing that, man. I really do appreciate you guys. So that said, do uh, you guys have any last remarks or anything before we shut this thing down? I had fun. No, I enjoyed it. All yeah. right, cool, man. And I think everybody in the audience enjoyed it as well. Uh, once again, I thank you guys, and I'll be talking to you guys soon. All right, take care. God bless. God bless. All right, folks, another great debate in the books. Excellent guy, excellent job by both parties, man. And and I like these type of debates. Trinitarian debates are always fun. You know, they're always fun. They, that's, the, that's the core right there, man. I mean, that's the essence right there, man. You're, you're talking about the Lordship of Jesus Christ and who he is, the person of Jesus, you know, and how the Holy Spirit works in there. Who is he? You know, who is the Father? You know, you get into these debates, man. They're fun. They're enjoyable. And I, I really thank Stacy and Anthony for coming on and being able to dive into these areas of thought. And I pray that you guys enjoyed it, too. You know, um, I see the live chat was lit up, you know. Uh, I had a whole bunch of viewership today and I appreciate everyone who's jumping out here viewing the gospel truth and as you know you know I really want you guys to really subscribe to this channel you know I want you guys to subscribe 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 I can't emphasize it enough because the the channel is not going to grow without your support and without your help and um, I, I just really I need you guys to to continue to to view, to continue to come on the show and share the content, subscribe to the content. Don't just be a viewer, you know. Don't just be one of those guys who know a debate is coming up and just jumps on the channel just to view. Uh, be a supporter uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the idea of what well, to subscribe. You know, um, you don't have to be a supporter financially. That's not the only way to support the ministry. Uh, you can support the ministry with a subscribe and hit that notification bell, right? That's all you need to do to be a supporter of the ministry. And once again, I thank you guys for viewing. Um, I'm going to be getting out of here. And once again, I thank Anthony and Stacy for coming on and jumping on a gospel truth. And I look forward to getting those guys on again. I, I really like those guys. And I pray that you guys will continue to support. 
Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Gospel Truth. May God bless you and may God keep you. Oh.